How's it going, everybody? This is Dave Meltzer. We're going to be here for the next two hours talking pro wrestling with Brian Alvarez of Figure Four Weekly. And uh, we'll be taking all your phone calls and your emails uh, during the next two hours. Gosh, that sounds so redundant. Brian, how are you today? I'm doing good. Good weekend? Yeah, it was good. good. Pretty uh, laid back weekend, so that was that was what was good about it. I didn't have to wrestle or anything like that. Got a lot of the newsletter done. Didn't go bowling. It was good. <laughs> Yeah, I got a lot. I got um pretty pretty decent amount done as well. Um, it's it seemed really just I don't know the weekend just seemed so much easier uh, with so much less wrestling. Uh, but yeah. that's not a but to me that wasn't really that's not that's not a good sign. Uh, I even had time to watch Heat. Did you really? I didn't. I didn't. The watch first heat. heat ever that I've seen on MTV, and I suppose it'd be yeah. ruining my credibility to say that it was the best Heat ever because it was the first one I ever saw, but. This had to be the best heat ever. Steve Regal was the host. It was great. Uh huh. Wrestling was uh, pretty subpar, but you know, Regal did his comedy the whole show. Made fun of Michael Cole. Can't ask for much more than that. And actually, I think that the uh, Eddie Guerrero Test match may have been better than the one they had at WrestleMania, which isn't really? saying a whole lot, but it was all right. Well, he didn't get his ankle caught for. <laughs> he didn't get stuck in the ropes for uh, 25 minutes while uh, yeah. everybody in the ring panicked trying to get him out. Yeah, today was a New Japan show at the Osaka Dome, and uh, it was really weird. Um, I I don't, <laughs> you know, <laughs> haven't we been Japan saying that for just, a while now about all these New Japan shows? Well, I mean, they've been weird in a different way, but now that Antonio Inoki has taken over like more of the booking of the main events, and and plus he's doing Pride and he's trying to like mix and match, um, and then you've got Chono out there who's you know trying to copy American wrestling, booking his match. And you've got this, like, you know, it's like, I, I don't know. It, basically, the there's there, they, there's like none of the old New Japan, which is what built the company, and instead you've got one guy, you know, chasing the American style, which the fans really don't get into, and then someone else chasing the shoot style, which, you know, is okay. Like, it, it worked with Ogawa in the Ogawa-Hashimoto feud, but you can't have a steady diet of it because pro wrestling is not a shoot. Um, and they did some just really weird stuff and then you know TV Asahi did some really weird stuff and we'll talk about that um, I mean it's it you know in reading it and, and and basically I've gotten a lot of different responses to it I think the hardcore fans pretty much hated it I think the casual fans liked parts of it but still hated parts too <laughs> and it, there was so much WCW ish not 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 that they copied WCW but they did things that reminded me of something that only could happen in WCW and I think the first match tells the whole story. It was Jushin Liger against Kazunari Murakami, and they had a really great angle. It was actually aired on television last Saturday night. It would have taken place a couple days before that. So they they start they go in there. They have the ring introductions, and then they go to a commercial break right when the <laughs> bell rings. And when they come back, the match is already over. The match went like a minute fifty-seven. Ended in a DQ. Now you, what those was of you DQ, followed, by the way? What Liger won what by DQ. What was a DQ? Um, I think because he unmasked him and because Ogawa interfered. Okay. So Mur so they come back. Liger doesn't have a mask on. The match is already over. Ogawa's running around going crazy. Everyone's running around in the ring fighting. And they don't show a replay of it because I guess they didn't have the tape machines rolling. And um, I'm not even sure. Um, you, know, th th that's what, you know, that's basically what happened. And, that's pretty um, much the story of the entire show was the commercials all started... Like, when the match started. Why don't you do it during ring introductions or immediately after the match when they're doing the post-match or whatever? Why I guess it make sense they felt to do it for the actual wrestling? I guess they felt that the post-match was more important than the wrestling matches. Hmm. Um, How about the pre-match? Now, 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 I will say this. On, on live... Dub, on, on the, the commercials themselves... Okay, this is the difference. Okay, The commercials themselves during the matches is not unusual for live coverage of Dome shows. I mean, in every Dome special that I remember, they would have a commercial right to start. The difference is, is that those matches used to always go, you know, like 10 to 20 minutes. When the match goes two minutes and you have a commercial and it's over, that's that's why people were so much more upset because, you know, like when you have a six-minute match and you're losing the first two minutes for a commercial, you're losing a lot. When you got a 20-minute match and you lose the first two minutes, you know, people aren't lighting up the switchboards, which, in fact, they did light up the switchboards. I see the Asahi uh, complaining about this. So anyway, Ogawa, uh, it ends up with a big brawl, and Ogawa... Um, and Tatsumi Fujinami, who was doing color, end up fighting. Um, and then Ricky Choshu's music play. And it's huge pop. Choshu comes out. Him and Ogawa start fighting. Everyone's fighting. They're challenging each other, which probably will lead to something on May 5th at the Fukuoka Dome. 
Uh, what, what happened then, though, is uh, they had a match. It was Choshu and Shiro Koshinaki against Toshiaki Kawada and Masafuchi. And since there was so much heat for Choshu against Ogawa, the first ever meeting of any kind with Choshu and Kawada, I mean, I don't want to say it got no heat because it got good heat, but it just seemed so secondary that it was not a big deal. And um, then when Fuji tagged in, nobody cared because nobody took him seriously, and Choshu lariated him to win in about nine minutes. The crowd, by the way, was announced at 27,000, but I think the real number was probably closer to 20. It was definitely the smallest crowd for a New Japan Dome show in history, which is not good, although I'm not surprised because it was a weak lineup. Mm. In, a in a surprise, Yuji Nagata beat Manabu Nakanishi. I heard they had a good match. Um, with uh, two enziguris, actually an enziguri to the back and then a high kick to the front. So Nagata will challenge the new IWGP champion, who's Kazuki Fujita's, we'll get to in a second, also on May 5th at the Fukuoka Dome. Then it was a six-man tag, which I heard was the best match on the entire show. It was um, uh, Masahiro Chono returning, which also makes no sense because Masahiro Chono was put out of action due to injuries, you know, work injuries. I mean, he'd been just banged up and needed a rest, but with, with Don Fry. So when he comes back for his first match back, he goes against Bat, which is a, for whatever, Badass Translate, translate trading, trading or something. Is that what it is? I know yeah. it's Badass something. So anyway, he's going against them, and Don Fry is a member of that team, but Don Fry is not in this match. So anyway, it's Chono, Tenzan, and Kojima against Mudo, uh, Taiokea from All Japan, and Jinsei Sunzaki. And, and Tenzan and Kojima are an awesome tag team. I mean, they are they're the best tag team in the business right now as far as a uh, pure in-ring work, carrying opponents, that kind of style of work. I mean, it's like Edge and Christian are funnier outside the ring, um, and the Hardys do do like a lot of you know they'll do more spectacular moves. But I mean, if you watch the Hardys when it comes to like selling and work and and just the whole around thing, if they're not doing gimmick stuff, I mean, I'm not saying they're not good, but Tenzan and Kojima are just way more solid as far as the ability to carry people. They're they're really a good team. Well, anyway. Uh, the finish of that one, Chono pinned Shinzaki, but um, Hiroshi Hase was at ringside, and there was a lot of stuff involving him. Chono and him got into a fight. Chono attacked him at ringside. He, you know, uh, later gave a chair to to, um, to uh, Mudo for Mudo to attack Chono with. And anyway, when the match was over, Chono got the clean pin, and then Hase did a run in and gave Yurinagi suplexes, which is similar but not exactly to, to a rock bottom. I mean, the rock bottom was. Basically stolen from a Uranage, it's just not quite done as well. And um, so anyway, he gave them to all three guys, and then challenged Chono to a match. And um, I guess his last thing to Chono was, you know, in Japanese, it was like, you know, uh, um, and 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 what is your final answer? Which is sort of a takeoff on who wants to be a millionaire, whatever that thing is that they say at the end. Um, and then Chono came back with something about like, you know, you know, you should be more worried about your friend, which is. Um, a reference to Prime Minister Mori, who resigned a couple of days ago, who was Hase's political ally and friend, in fact, campaigned for Hase when he was running for the Senate. And um, his approval rating was like 10%, which sounds just <laughs> terrible, because <laughs> their economy's in shambles. And uh, anyway, the um, so anyway, so that's what Chono said, which actually that got a pretty big pop when uh, he said, you know, you should be worried about your friend. Uh, then the IWGP championship match, uh, Fujita beat Scott Norton. And, I mean, you know, it sounds like a terrible match. It probably was a terrible match. Um, there was a lot of outside interference. Uh, I know Brian Johnston and um, Gary Goodridge it was Gary, yeah, were out there brawling with Team 2000 outside the ring, which is probably just as well. But um, Fujita beat him with a choke clean, and um, he got both belts. You know, because he, he came in with Inoki's old IWGP belt. So, I mean, the, the way it was kind of like... And it was no pinfall match. So, I mean, the gimmick is, is that when Scott Norton gave him a power bomb, he couldn't pin him. So, uh, because there's no, it, the only match could only end by a, you know, by, it was basically pride rules, theoretically. So it could be a tap out or a, or a, a knockout. So, um, anyway, um, you know, Fujita won with a choke and the referee ended up stopping it when Norton was out. And I guess it's really weird, though, you know, Fujita is IWGP GP champion. I guess it, it's just so weird, because when Fujita left New Japan, he was like an opening match guy, and now he's like a world champion, and yeah, I guess the only good news is that Norton isn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, he got those uh, big wins, even though they were flukes, so I guess yeah, it counts for something. Isn't that the weirdest? That's so I don't know weird, what it counts for, but it counts for something. 
but he was not super over or anything like that. Because I think that you know if you know if you watch those matches, I mean in both cases it's not like it's not like he really beat either of those guys. It's like they 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 beat themselves. Yeah. You know, unless he's got that that whatever that is. You know, and they actually did the Just same thing. Look at Gardner. Like, he was this big superstar. He never beat anybody. No, he avoided he getting that beat, guy though. down, but uh he avoided getting beat. You know what? It's the same thing as Rulon Gardner. If Rulon Gardner had actually like done something offensive to win that match, I think because you know when the we, as we both talked about when the news came out about that match, that was like huge headlines everywhere because nobody oh, actually yeah. saw it. Okay, yep. and then when all of a sudden like that night when we watched the match and and all of a sudden it was like, oh my god! I mean, you actually felt sorry for Corellin because it was like mm -hmm. God, you know, you win 250 matches in a row and. And your streak ends like that? Because of your you know, grip? Because you let go for a split second. Yeah. Although he was going to lose the point anyway. I mean, when I got an email from you, it was like, uh, you know, Corella and you lost. Me, didn't you email and me I, first? I think I, you we were like me. emailing all night long or something like that. Yeah, right? yeah. Cause I, I thought I'd you actually emailed me first going, uh, he lost. And I just thought, man, this guy get pinned or, you know, what the hell happened? And it turns out he just grip slipped. And that was the end of that. So. Yeah, one nothing. But, you know, that guy became a superstar off that. And... You know, what kind of a win was it? But Same he didn't really, though. He didn't really, though, if you think about it. I mean, what's Ruling Gardner now? Yeah. I, I mean, mean for the time being. They might as well get as much at a... It was a one-day thing, though. Because once people saw it, I think that it, it really... Like, if he had really beaten him decisively, I think Ruling Gardner, you know, would have been a lot bigger superstar. Mm-hmm. But, um, anyway, the main event... With the same rules, which is uh, Hashimoto against Kensuke Sasaki. Hashimoto did a brain buster on Sasaki, and um, you know the match only went eight minutes because they were rushing to, to end it, and you know and all that. But anyway, um, Hashimoto did the brain buster, and he couldn't pin him, so he just started kicking the hell out of him, and then they stopped the match. And people didn't like, you know, like in a pro wrestling mentality, you know, you're expecting the big comeback, and they didn't get it, and they just were not ready for that match to end in eight minutes. So yeah. very cold uh, reaction. Anyway. I'll get a tape of that. And um, the other, in the preliminary matches, there was actually a common theme to the prelims. Um, I'll go through. There was three three matches that didn't were not on TV because they did a live television special on TV Asahi. So this would be the the biggest audience to watch TV, a live television show in Japan and and maybe anywhere um, at one time. You know, for, for this whole year, uh, most likely. Because well, who knows? Who knows? Because there were so many people complaining about the commercials. Maybe the rating wasn't that good. Last year the rating was out was, was you know they did 15.7 rating last year. But anyway, it was uh, Takashi Zuka beat Minoru Tanaka, who is the uh, IWGP Junior Heavyweight Champion, getting beat by a mid card heavyweight. And then Yutaki Yoshie, who was a totally uncharismatic fat heavyweight, beat Shinya Makabe, who was a up and coming great junior heavyweight. <laughs> and then Brian Johnston, who is a um, he has a great look and no ability. And I don't want to say no ability. That's not fair. Just very green. Heavyweight beat Kendo Kashin, who's a pretty darn good working junior heavyweight whose career is doomed. And he how beat long? him in two, two minutes and 20 seconds with a front guillotine choke. That guy's dead. Yeah, well, he's going to be even deader because he's supposed to fight High and Gracie at the next show. Well, they're trying to get Johnston, um, they're trying to get Johnston over to fight in Valley Tudo. You know, and you know, he's, he, they got him from UFC. He's, Brian Johnston is a phenomenally talented fighter. He's just not a, um, What's the word I'm looking for? Phenomenally talented wrestler? No, he's got a great look. He's not a phenomenally talented pro wrestler. No, no, but I'm talking about as a fighter, he's got great skills, but he doesn't have a great heart in that I don't think he really likes getting beat up. And I guess maybe no one does. <laughs> but um, if you've ever watched his matches, he... You know, like, once he's taken down and he's on his back, he just never gets up from it. But when he's beating yeah. people up, he's quite ferocious. And, um, I mean, he's like, you know, he's 6'4", probably 235, 240. He can wrestle pretty good. He's got very good judo training. He can kickbox pretty darn good. I mean, he's got the skills and the look and all that. But, like, if he goes against a wrestler and the wrestler takes him down, it's just like, at that point, he's kind of like, uh, okay, let's get out of this fight. You know what I mean? It's not like... Yeah. You know, that's, I mean, that was, if you ever watched his UFC fights, I mean, every, every one of them is like, as soon as he got taken down, you know, he pretty much, he never got up. And the only one he, he lasted any time with once he was taken down was Shamrock. And, and, you know, Shamrock just pounded the hell out of him. And, and I think the whole gimmick on that one was that, you know, um, the, what was the name of it? The, 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 that was the really, that was a really weird ultimate ultimate. And, um, 
three guys, I think, in the same tournament, maybe four. No, there's Mark Hall, Don Fry, Gary Goodridge, and um, who was and, and uh, Johnston were all managed by the same guy. And I think um, was it Robert De Persia? Working each other. Um, yeah, well, so Robert De Persia. This was by the way, the last time that he was ever around a UFC. So he's managing like half of the people in the Ultimate Ultimate, as it turns out. And so I think that the idea was is Ken Shamrock was was probably the best fighter in that Ultimate Ultimate. Um, certainly he was the favorite going in, and, and Johnston was his first round opponent. Wasn't that the fight where he, he beat up Johnston and broke his hand and couldn't go on? Yes, yes, that was okay. the fight. So so anyway, the the basic gist was that Johnston's role was you know now actually Johnston. I know that Shamrock felt that this, the toughest guy in the whole tournament for him was going to be Johnston. And he actually manipulated it so he would get Johnston in the first round when he was fresh, figuring that the other guys would be easier and it's okay if he was tired. He wanted the, you know, the, the toughest guy first. So, so he respected Johnston. So anyway, he took Johnston down and just you know pounded the hell out of him and, and broke his hand in the process. Or Actually, it wasn't broken, but it was almost broken. He damaged it greatly and couldn't come out. And the idea was Johnston's role was that he couldn't tap because they had to wear Ken down so Don Fry... Or whomever, who and Don Fry ended up winning the whole tournament. Don Fry would have a week in Ken, so so it was like his job was to not tap early. And I mean, I was like right there at ringside, right, like just a few feet away from this corner where Shamrock's got um, Brian in the corner, and he's just pounding him. And Brian is just sitting there wanting to tap, knowing that like he can't, and he's just like going like under his breath. He's just swearing, going like <laughs> you know, you know what I mean? Yeah. He can't. So finally, you know, finally after being pounded on for about five minutes, I, I think it was, he did tap, and it was when Ken started shift, switching hands, you know, and I go, oh my God, he switched hands, he probably broke his hand on the guy's head, hit him so many times, and basically that's what happened. Sure and, enough. And Don Fry won the tournament, because Tank Abbott slipped, so anyway, that's the story of that. Let's see, Santo beat Sicosis in their hair versus mask match Friday in Tijuana, which I have not watched the tape of, although i got the tape in the machine right now, so I'm going to watch it as soon as the show's over. And I heard that was a phenomenal match, and they had a huge crowd. And Puerto Rico um, had, with Kane and Terry Funk down there, and Miguel Perez joined the Bariquas. Uh, they had a really big weekend. IWA was was just doing very well. Um, on Raw tonight, we don't know any matches, but um, let's see what's going on with Raw. Um, Jim Ross will be announcing the show tonight. I don't know what they wrote on the um, preview, like will Jim Ross announce or not, but uh, uh, I think he's going to be announcing. Um God, I'm trying to think. So any any uh, uh, Pep Boys uh, pulled out of uh, advertising on SmackDown, mm -hmm. uh, citing that uh, they didn't like what they saw. That was a PTC deal. Uh, any other any other stuff I'm missing from the weekend? No, I mean no WWF shows weekend. the whole weekend. What? Yeah, it's quiet around here. Yeah, it was everything was uh, everything was foreign. There was nothing uh, domestic at all. No WWF shows. Um, ECW declared bankruptcy on Friday, officially. Although well, you know that was. Pretty much expected. There's something here. Uh, where was it? Oh, let me get to this. Uh, this is a poll question for the weekend on WrestleMania. Uh, what was the greatest match in the history of WrestleMania? Savage Steamboat ended up winning it with 26% of the vote. Bret Hart and Owen Hart had 20%. Uh, Michaels and Razor Ramon ladder match had 21%. Bret Hart and Steve Austin uh, from uh, 1997 WrestleMania, the, that was the I Quit match, had 25%. It actually lost by two votes to Savage and Steamboat, and then Rock and Steve Austin from this year got 7%. So pretty much everyone was figuring one of those other four matches was the best one. Today's question is, is it possible to run a national, a profitable, that's a very important word, a profitable national pro wrestling company against the WF today? A, no. B, yes, but only by copying the WF style. C, yes, but only by coming up with your own new style. Or D, yes, by doing old style but having good booking and good logic. So that's Or E, if Vince Russo and Dave McClain hook up. <laughs> yeah, right. Did you read that? What? No, I did not. Oh, his newest uh, website, Delia Bob, is uh, whatever the hell he called it. He's talking about a meeting with Dave McClain when he was in California. And uh, <laughs> things may be happening there, he says. You need well, something new. And wow is that. That new product. Well, well, wow, wow did lose three million dollars in a quarter, which is more than ECW lost all of last year. And <laughs> oh my God, you know, I, I don't even know what to say when you brought that up. <laughs> it's just like I emailed you the whole thing so you can check it out. Oh, this is so wonderful. I have something to look forward to. 
Like, yeah, hey, are the Yankees know. in California? What's the big team in California? Yeah, Brian, oh my God. Don't ever talk about sports. No, the, the, what, okay, what sport are we talking about? The uh, he is sport. baseball. Actually. Russo's favorite sport. Oh, San Francisco Giants. That's okay, their, yeah, that's, that's what he's talking about. He goes, I went to California to watch the Giants play. Why, you ask? Because he was such a tremendously loyal person. He puts that in all capital letters. And while he was there, he had the big meeting with Dave McClain. Great. And he broke the news that WOW will be restarting operations in September. Oh, yes. They're, they're, they're going to try to get funding for another season? That's, how, that now, how is that gonna... season, yes. Okay, now how is that going to be any different than this first season? Well, Russo will be there. So? <laughs> He's talking about how, look at how great the ratings are with the women and blah, blah, blah. And it's a great... Okay, you gotta... okay, 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 okay. You know what? <laughs> they didn't. I know. At the end, they didn't. Okay, okay. I think no, they only gave one example in the whole thing. I didn't go back to check it out, but I think its example was the night that they did the bikini contest at Club La Vela where Tori Wilson won. I think yes. he said that Nitro, that six-minute segment beat the return of Steve Austin. And it may no, well have. I didn't go back Oh, God. Oh, did oh it not? God. What? That was, <laughs> when was that? It was like 90, 98? Club Levet had been spring. It had been the spring break of '99, right? I think it, it might have been the '98. No, spring break, spring break of 2000. I think it was spring break of 2000 when they did the No, 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 no. It was farther back than that. Spring break of '99. Yeah. Okay, that was the one where it would have been right after Sable left. So they're okay. Well, yeah, look, when it, Nash it, came out and Sable eat your heart out. Sable eat your heart out, right? But even if it did, so what? That's two years ago. What does that matter now? And I don't think it did anyway. But yeah. it's like, so what? WCW, um, you know, up up through 80, 98, WCW regularly beat out WWF, you know, numbers for different quarter hours. No big deal. I just like the whole six minute, the six minute segment part. He made it very specific that that six minutes. But he doesn't even know. Return of he doesn't that even whole know quarter, that. He's just, he's just, you know, every time you look back and and like he'll say something like that and you look it up, like oh, you know, like we did this segment and it beat out like what Flair and Hogan did, and you look it up and it's like it's not even. There was no Flair and Hogan, and it was like. Do you know what I mean? And then when you look up yep. when Flair and Hogan last wrestled, it was like a 4.4, and he's talking about it not being able to do a, you know, doing a 1.9. And it's like, you know. Look. And for all you Vince Russo fans out there that listen to this show, he will be doing a chat on that website following Raw next week. But unfortunately, you have to send in your questions early so they can screen them for the uh, proper response from Vince Russo. Okay, great. All right, anyway, let's get out of this. Um... I know this isn't going to happen, but somebody has got to get Antonio Inoki and Ricky Choshu out of power. They were slowly sending New Japan Pro Wrestling to the same level as WCW. God, I was thinking that just this morning as I was reading over the TV show. <laughs> somebody has got to get the, break the news to them that this pseudo-shoot-style wrestling stuff they're trying to push isn't working. Um, so the problem is, it's not so much that the sh you can't do the shoot-style in one match and the WWF style in the other match. You've got to have your own... St you can do the shoot-style... I mean, like, the shoot style with Ogawa and Hashimoto was a big success, but you can't have a whole promotion of it because you just can't. And the other thing is is that you can't have it while you have a WWF-style match somewhere else. And the New, J you, New Japan got very successful doing a certain style, and they're, like, abandoning it. And and that's that's what's, you know, not doing very well. I mean, they just killed hey, that all. At least they cut the commercial and it cut to a backstage segment with Hogan cutting a promo. Um, yeah, I guess. I don't know. Used to so do anyway, that. Um, they're destroying their respected cruiserweight division. Uh, they sure are. And they have them job to undercard heavyweights as both counterproductive and downright insulting. Um, you know, it's probably not so much that they're... Uh, it's like... I think if they like... Law, law, if the cruiserweights against the heavyweights and the cruiserweights lost 70% of the time and won 30% of the time, I think it would work. But when it's like 95% of the time, it's it's bad. Uh, I would just love to get inside the heads of Inoki and Shoshu and figure out what the hell they're thinking. Shoshu's real tough. I don't know what's in his head. I actually think I do understand what Inoki's thinking. Actually, Brian, you kind of like wrote something, and it was kind of clicked in my head, and I started thinking like I was still in the 70s watching wrestling, and I totally understood where Inoki's going. Unfortunately, nobody else does. <laughs> <laughs> There's actually a long... I actually wrote this in The Observer. There's a long explanation. I totally understand what Inoki's doing. I don't agree with it, but I I actually do. I mean, the whole thing is is that Inoki's trying to get himself over as the greatest shoot fighter of all time, 
and <laughs> in his prime, and he's backdating stories to the 70s by bringing up his old, his old belts, and he's going to put his old belts on guys like uh, Fujita and Mark Coleman, who were super shooters, and therefore, since they're super shooters, then him, who originated those belts, was also a super shooter, aside from being the best pro wrestler, because he thinks that pro wrestling, everyone kind of knows, is a work, uh, but he's trying to preserve his legacy. So anyway, that's the Reader's Digest version of that. And speaking of great things, after New Japan Wrestling and WCW and WOW with Vince Russo, we're now going to talk about the XFL, which, by the way, did set its all-time record low rating for NBC on Saturday night, and I do not have the rating for Sunday yet because Nielsen's slow, uh, which actually uh, they, they, the rating wasn't done by even uh, 4 o'clock. Um, so anyway, uh, this is from Hector Ruiz, who goes, I just thought of a scenario to explain why Vince is talking about having a second season. I want to know what you think the likelihood for this is. Could it be that Vince is going to go to UPN and TNN and say he wants to do a second season? So when they say, no, please, Vince can say, <laughs> okay, let's make a deal, uh, and tells them he won't do XFL, but they have to both give him a good time slot for WCW. So basically the talk of a second season is just a power play for Vince to get a good time slot for WCW. So Sounds like a great story. TNN and UPN? I don't buy it. I don't buy it for That's a second. Too much. But yeah, um, but as far yeah, it is too much. Now the deal is okay. UPN's contract for the XFL ends after this season. They can get out of it. It's not like in, NBC actually is going to have to pay some sort of a penalty because they have a two-year unbreakable contract that they're obviously going to break. The um, the uh, UPN contract they can just get out of. Now TNN's contract for the XFL is a contract that is actually for the life term of the league, which means that. They cannot get out of this contract as long as Vince has it. But Vince obviously is not going to use TNN. Can they pay a penalty though if they want to get out? I don't. Uh, why would they even bother? Do you know what I mean? They have it's to like air those games. Yeah, but what ratings do they get on Sunday afternoon? It's not like they're getting any worse ratings than they would usually get. You know, it's not. True. It's not like UP. It's not like UPN, which is giving up you know prime time, and the and the affiliates are getting mad. I mean TNN, mm -hmm. TNN, you know, five, point five on a Saturday on a Sunday afternoon. You know, it's. It's no worse than they get anyway. I mean, it's it's not a nightmare for them, and why piss off Vince? Vince gives them raw, you know what I mean? Yeah. Actually, maybe they could make a deal and say, and Vince go, hey, give us Sunday afternoon for wrestling. Actually, they would probably take that deal, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. What's the lineup look like for Backlash? Well, hopefully they'll come up with one. Um, I mean, we, the main event looks like Undertaker and Kane against Austin and Helmsley, and then... Maybe Ben Juan Jericho against Regal and Angle, maybe. I mean, we'll probably have a better idea tonight. Hopefully they'll start. It's 29th, so they got, uh, let's see, we got three weeks of television. Usually they don't, like, finish their their lineups until, like, the the Friday. Actually, usually usually they finalize the lineups for pay-per-views the Sunday before the pay-per-view so they can shoot the final angles on the Monday and Tuesday TV. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see. I was wondering what the WF has in store next for Eddie Guerrero. Uh, any Anything hinted? He goes, you the test... So would do little for the European title. I think they should put him against Taz. Um, hey, they may. What the hell? Come Why not? Taz emails again. Yeah. It's hey, coming Anderson. back. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, that's because we, 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 it's our fault they do, though. It's from Ryan Anderson. Do you know where and the... He pretty much beat him clean last night, too. Low blow and a roll-up. Yeah. Didn't have the uh, 15 people running in like WrestleMania. Do you know what, when the, do you know when the book, what, what the book fully is good is all about? Uh, does it continue or have a nice day left off? I don't know the whole book. Um, I think that a lot of the book is like actually defending the WWF against all its criticism, which actually, um, and I was kind of told by the author himself, we were going through, actually, I, I, I've talked to him a lot about this book, but I don't know exactly, well, I kind of have a good feeling of a lot of what he's going to do. And he told me that, um, you know, like the first book, you know how he, he, he skirted the drug issue, right? And he got, yeah. and that was actually probably about the only criticism from Inside Wrestling. Well, my, uh, uh, the main criticism from, from people like that listened to the show was, you know, he skirted the drug issue. So he's addressing the drug issue, and he told me, unfortunately, a lot of people are going to get real down on how I handle it. So I think he skirt, he addressed it by skirting it again. But maybe not. Maybe not. This goes, last week you said that you have never met Brian. I find that hard to believe. No, we lied. No, actually, it's true. We've never met. Um, who has the best chance of these three of going to the WWF? Vince Russo, Bret Hart, or Eric Bischoff? Bischoff. Bret Hart. Bret Hart. Going to the can WWF? Um, of WWF taking them? I'd say Bret Hart. They can make more I money. I think Bret Hart's going back. No, no, I don't think it'll happen. I'm just saying. Oh, if they WWF, had the opportunity and all three guys wanted to come in? Yeah. Yeah, Bret. Yeah, that's that's, that's how I review it. Yes, yeah, 
As far as like, but what, as of what today, happened? Bischoff. You think that if the three want to come well, in, I'm just saying they Brett would pick... want to come back, so it'd be oh, okay, okay. and Russo, so they take okay, Bischoff. Okay, of those three, okay, okay, well, you're saying yeah, yeah, I would agree. Okay, of the best chance, if, because uh, Bret Hart wouldn't want to come back, you're right. Um, and yeah, so there'd be Russo and Bischoff. Yeah, I'd say Bischoff because Bischoff's a better television performer than Russo. Uh, do you think Linda's return will be, Linda's surprise tonight will be the return of HBK? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Do you think, um, Triple H winning the Intercontinental title was sudden and made no sense unless there's a working program between Jericho and Triple H? I, I mean, I think it made sense they're trying to elevate the Intercontinental. It made sense in other ways too. Uh, let's see. Any news regarding Tori Wilson? No. I believe Jacqueline's contract is up for renewal. I think that she's already been renewed. I'm, in fact, I'm pretty much positive of that. Uh, when are the contracts for Stephen Richards and the Good Father up? I've heard they won't be renewed. Uh, I have no idea. Uh, I don't know if that's true. Have Shane Douglas, Ernest Miller, Alex Wright, and Disco been let go? I don't know what the st status is of any of them. Um, some of the guys have been let go, um, but I don't know about uh, Disco. Has not Disco? I'm pretty sure hasn't been because I think I would know if he had. Um, Ernest Miller, I'm pretty sure has not been let go. But I think he's got, I think Ernest Miller's got some time left, like a decent amount of time left on his contract anyway. Um, Douglas, don't know, I mean, I, I, I don't know what the status is of Douglas. I don't think he's been let go, though. Uh, let's see. Um, I don't know if he even has, well, he probably does have cycles. Uh, this is from James Blunt, who goes, I seriously doubt WCW will be successful with the late night time slot. Now that WCWF and WCW are one company, would it be possible to give WCW the TNN live wire hour and MTV heat hour? Uh, sure. If they wanted to, they could do that tomorrow. It's their show. Mm -hmm. I don't think that it's necessary to have both Livewire and Superstars, so there's no real loss there. And there's no real loss on either of them because neither of those shows. WCW needs almost primetime heat more than WWF does. Totally agree. Now, how does that, uh, I have a question real quick. The cycle, like the 90-day cycle, does that, does it begin the day that you sign, so it's 90 days after you've signed, or does the cycle end on a specific day for everybody every 90 days? No, no, no. It's everyone's different. It's it's, it's okay. like ninety day cycles from the day that you sign. So like one guy will be May twelfth, one guy will be May sixteenth, one guy will be okay. you know, yeah, okay. Uh, it's from Patrick who goes. I've noticed how Dean Malenko has been used on and off um, in the WWF. Unfortunately, he's been jobbed at quite a few times uh, to in really bad tag against really bad tag teams. Is Malenko on the outs or are they moving him to WCW? Um, I think that he's been considered move, being moved to WCW. Actually, um, I don't think he's on the outs as far as that goes. Do you think it's possible that Jim, that Jim Ross denying The Rock will be on the new WCW sh show? Um, do you think it's possible that he's denying it um, as a surprise to do the new storylines like Rock appearing on the show would be played up as a surprise? JR did this with the Radicals who had yet to sign. That's true. He did do it with the Radicals who had yet to sign. But in this case, no. Uh, the movie's real. Uh, let's see. What's the heat between Heyman and Cornette? Uh, ask him the next time Cornette's on the show. It's... It, They've had heat for years and years, but a lot of it just stems from um, Cornette's, like when he did, uh, there's just been a, a lot of things that Cornette, you know, I mean, they, they just have heat back and forth. They have totally different philosophies of wrestling, and they're both passionate in their philosophies. And Cornette worked a couple of times and did made some business deals with Heyman, and he thinks Heyman double-crossed him, believe it or not. Um, you know, just like on the gangsters thing, and then when Cornette went to work there, and just a lot of different, you know, one time Cornette, you know, gave a tape of, some Smoky Mountain stuff for Paulie to use on TV, and he was supposed to get paid, and he never got paid, and so he says. So, you know, and just philosophical differences of people who've known each other for, for 20 years and have totally different ideas on everything. Um, let's see, how would you rate Shane Douglas as a worker in his prime? Uh, prime, which was many years ago, good. Certainly never great, but good. Uh, let's see... This is, who is most likely to win the champion carnival tournament? Let's see. If it was me, Kawada. If I was, any of you may win. Let's see, it's Kawada, Taiokea, and uh, Tenru are like the, the ones who have a chance, I think. I mean, I think Mark, Mike Barton is still um, alive points-wise, but the best that he'll do is lose in the finals, and I don't even think he'll do that. So I think, yeah. I think probably Kawada. I think Tenor uh, has just won so many matches so fast, and I know he's got a bad neck, but he did do that thirty-minute draw. That you know they're just setting him up to not win. Yeah, I think to lose in the finals. Yeah. Yeah. The thing is, though, is that um, they could, I don't know. There's, there's, 
Hmm. Uh, I, I could see Taiyuke going to the finals and losing to Kawada. No, because Tenru's already locked in the finals. He's already in the finals. Yeah. And then it's uh, Kawada needs a, a draw with Steve Williams or a win over Steve Williams, which is actually tomorrow, to get into the finals. And I think Taiyuke would need to beat... Taiyuke and Mike Barton are tied, and if either of them win, uh, they if, if they don't do a draw, then one of them will also be in the finals, so they may end up with a three-way final. Um, actually, if they don't do a draw with those two, it will be, and, and Williams beats Kawada, in which case it will be Barton or Taioke against Tenru. So Tenru's in, and that's sort of how it stands right now. Uh, I know there are a lot of rumors about Shawn Michaels on Raw tonight. Okay. There uh, are. <laughs> I guess there are. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, let's see. Uh, is there any pro wrestling in China? I know there's no pro wrestling ability in China. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> okay, that's cute. Since the WWF recently signed Jerry Lynn and Tajiri and probably Guido, do you think WWF will I get... I should apologize for that comment. What? Never mind. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you think WWF will get a light heavyweight division on track? This is a joke. <laughs> uh, let's see... Uh, I keep reading complaints that Triple H. Sometimes never we get over- questions like that that just have to be a joke. But then I read them and I go, maybe this person's serious. The yeah. one last night in feedback about uh, a feud between Sean Stasiak and China could really uh, turn WCW wow. around. I almost died right there on the spot. Yeah, that, that was pretty funny. Um, I know they're hardcore, but what wrestler, if any, from XPW and CCW do you think is impressive enough to compete with the WF guys? I have not seen enough of those guys. Um, no one's like. Like mention any names of those guys. I mean, I know CCW's got um, God, who's the guy? I think it's Trent Acid. I saw him wrestle in Japan. He was really good. I'm not sure if Trent Acid's the guy though. Uh, but there was one CCW guy, junior heavyweight guy, who's really, really good. Um, I don't know if he's, you know, again, junior heavyweight WWF, kind of, kind of tough. Um, but of the XPW guys, um, actually, I have seen most of those guys, and I don't know of anyone there that's that's quite ready for the WWF. Um, let's see. You know what's funny is, um, uh, first group of emails, they're all about Japanese wrestling. <laughs> so, anyway, which I guess maybe, maybe who knows. Anyway, uh, we'll start. Who was the heel in the May 1st, 1999, or whatever it was, May 1st, the first Misao Kawada match at the Tokyo Dome? There was no heel. They really don't have heels and baby faces in Japan when the guys wrestle each other. Why is Scott Norton so big in Japan? I actually have an answer to that, believe it or not. Um, ten years ago, when Scott Norton first went to Japan, Stan Hansen was like really huge in Japan, and they were looking for New Japan was looking for, and Vader was huge, and they're just that. So that was the prototype of what uh, the Japanese promoters were looking for to introduce a new star. They tried with Tony Holm, who was horrible, and Scott Norton, who's also horrible. But um, they just pushed him to the moon, and in 1990-ish, when, it, when Scott Norton started going to Japan, and, and he was no better then than he is now, and probably no worse either, they had an array of workers, because Muto was young, Chono was young, Hase was awesome, um, and they put this guy over, and they were so good, especially Hase. Hase was so good at putting this guy over that he got over, and he just stayed over even though he's terrible, so that's, that's the deal. Um, they're they're into if, if if a big American gets pushed, they can get over. And Norton, you know, Norton ended up becoming something of a legend there because he's been going there for ten years and he's always been main events. They've always protected him, you know, always kept him strong. You know, held the IWGP title, and uh, that's the deal. Uh, let's see, why shouldn't Kobashi wrestle again? Um, because his knee his knees are shot, and he's going to end up in a wheelchair if he does. And when he, he'll come back too soon. And it's just a really sad story because the guy is, was, was like such an incredible wrestler. See, this is from John in Kelowna, BC, who says, in the paperback version of Mick Foley's book, he said that he had differences with another of the participants in the WrestleMania 2000 main event. Do you know who the participant was and what the problems were? I don't know. Uh, I think, everyone thinks it was the big show, but I think it was The Rock. I, but I don't know that. I just got that feeling. Um, Let's see. Who do you think is a better worker, Masao or Kawada? Right now, I don't think there's any question. It's Kawada. Um, Masao is just too beat up. Um, in their prime, boy, probably Masawa in their prime. Um, better psychology. Uh, it's, they were both awesome, though. Have New Japan and All Japan ever had an interpromotional show? Yeah, October 9th. 
they did pretty much it was built around uh, built around that. Uh, has anyone ever asked Brian Christopher what he thought about the Cat King situation? Um, I don't think it'd be worth asking him because <laughs> it's like I don't think he would ever want to answer it because he's doomed. You know, um, I mean, all he can do is like say that like um, you know, I mean, he can't say anything bad about Vince. You know, he's not in a position to do so. So I don't think he said anything. So some of you guys have heard Masao Kawada in 1994 is considered the best match in the history of wrestling. Do you think that's true? Uh, there's, I could not say any match is the best match in the history of wrestling, but Masao and Kawada had many matches that were among the best matches I ever saw. Uh, many of them, not just one of them. Uh, let's see. When's the WF going to build up a new wave of wrestlers? I'm thinking about the period in late 99 and early 2000 where they got Jericho, Angle, Benoit, and the rest of the radicals in quick succession. The problem at the moment seems to be a stagnation of the roster that leads to endless variations of Hunter, Austin, Kane, and Undertaker that we're getting. Is it difficult to elevate mid-card guys if there's no one ready to replace them? And who's ready in OVW or elsewhere? There's no one in OVW or elsewhere ready to come in and be in that level. Um, there are guys that are... Brad, I mean, Steve Bradley's ready to come in. Uh, Rio Constantino's probably ready to come in. Um, but I don't know that they would be... The, the, the thing with the WBF roster right now is it's so deep, and the, qual and the standard is so high that no new guy is going to be able to come in and like be so spectacular... It's almost like they're doomed, like uh, like what happened to all Japan and to a lesser extent New Japan, but definitely all Japan was when the standard of the work in the main events got so high, it made it almost impossible to create a new main eventer because they couldn't work good enough. But then the, the guys who they had as main eventers got stale because they kept wrestling each other all the time. I don't know Brian. What do you think? Brian's gone. I was wondering. Uh, let's see. Let me know when he's back. Uh, let's see. What do you think was the best WrestleMania main event match? Um, I'd say maybe this year's because because Savage Steamboat wasn't the main event. All the matches that we talked about over you know in the thing, I mean, even Bret Hart and Austin, which was obviously the biggest draw on that show, Undertaker and Sid was considered the main event. So I would say um, best main event. I would say Rock and Austin this year. Uh, yeah, I would say that. I would say that. Uh, what is your best guess for main event at WrestleMania 18? Too early to even think about it. Uh, let's see. Brian's still not there. Uh, what's the plan with... Oh, Brian's here. We're going to get just a second. Okay. I'm back. All right. Okay. What would the WWF buy rate equal in ratings? Like if Viacom wanted one of the WWF pay-per-views to put on CBS for free, what do you think the rating would be and how much... Dollars would WF charge CBS? Like if you put WrestleMania for free, well, WrestleMania is going to be forty million dollar plus show this year. But that's not but WWF's share will be over. Let's say, let's say, uh, what will it end up being? 16, 19, 20 million. Thirteen. Twenty if you include the lot. Well, that's right. Let's just just for the pay per view, it'll end up being about 15, let's say fifteen. Okay. Okay. Sixteen. Sixteen. More than sixteen. Seventeen. Okay. It's going to end up seventeen. Let's just say seventeen. So CBS would have to, WF would have to charge CBS 17 million to make up for that loss. So if CBS were, were to pay them 17 million for one three-hour show, then it would be worth it. Uh, I don't as far as that's going to happen. Rating would do for a show like that. That's got nothing to do with ratings. That just has to do with how much they would have to charge. I think charge. I was asking, what do you think it would get as far as a rating? If it was on CBS, um, I think it, I think it might get like a, an eight to a ten. Don't you think? You think could, so? You could, you could, on CBS, yeah, yeah, I think so. They can get it. I mean, if they can get a almost a six for a Raw on TNN, they can get a ten on CBS with with a month of promotion, two months of promotion. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think so. Uh, let's see. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Any word on whether Goldberg or Booker T will sign? There's nothing new on any of this stuff. Um, everything's, you know, I mean, no one has gotten any contract buyout offers from WCW, so stage or from from Turner. Time Warner, whatever it is. So as far as you know, as far as all of this goes, everything's in the same position that it was that it's been in from day one. That's why one of the reasons why I think that uh, they pushed the starting date back to June 9th because there's just not enough time to get everyone ready. Because you know, until these guys get offered a buyout and take the buyout, WWF can't exactly make plans for them. I wonder why it's taking so long for them to at least make an offer. Every week they're, they're paying out money. They're all screwed up. 
Uh, let's see. Of the wrestlers who have wrestled in the last 20 years, who has wrestled the most matches over the last 20 years? Biddy Flair. Yeah. Yeah, I would, I would, just as a guess, I'd say Flair. Yeah. Uh, he hasn't wrestled a lot of matches in the last few years, but, um, how many guys have been, um, how many guys have been around? Steamboat said something like he'd wrestled 6,000. So just think about Flair, who's still working in 2001. Let's see. They were probably working, um, let's see, in the 80s during the Crockett era. I mean, they were working 250 matches a year. I mean, there was a period, see, Probably late seventies, maybe even more than that. I mean, because that's when they were really going like you know six days a week, twice on Sundays, a lot of the time, um, twice on holidays. Uh, I don't doubt they were doing three hundred matches a year in that late seventies era. And there's no one. Is there anyone around from the late seventies besides Flair from that era where they were really working every day? That's working somewhat regularly now. That's still around in any capacity. So, I mean, I'm not talking about like Dusty, who's like sort of around, but you know hasn't wrestled in years, you know, regularly. I mean, all of those guys, they're all pretty much gone. So I would think it, I would think it almost for sure be Flair. Because nobody in Japan wrestled that kind of a schedule. You know, yeah. I mean, like where they ever wrestled like 250 matches a year. Uh, let's see. I've been thinking about How about Aguayo? Uh, you know, that's that, you know, you know what, you're right. Someone like that. Um, cause they used to wrestle tons of dates. Yeah, you know what? And Aguayo wrestled more regularly than Flair the last few years. It could be Aguayo. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's, that's a pretty good answer. I've been thinking about it, and if you give it some thought, I think this ECW bankruptcy thing is a work. Now, I know what you're thinking. You don't wa work a bankruptcy, but Paul Heyman's really smart and manipulative, and no one sees it coming. He files for bankruptcy, so everyone thinks he's completely out of the game. But then when the WF releases all the WCW guys with high salaries, he scoops them up, quits WF, starts back ECW on Fox. <laughs> and the you guy know goes, why uh, he filed bankruptcy? So he doesn't have to pay any money. Yeah. No, this, uh, this, was, this, was, this letter was a total spoof. Okay. I just want you to know. But uh, yeah, I think it was just a spoof. It was a spoof on the kind of letters that we get. I think. Okay. Do you think send Tank that to Abbott... our feedback section? I appreciate yeah. those. Do you think Mike Tyson will accept Tank Abbott's challenge? Please, come on. I mean, I wrote that thing. You know, I wrote that thing on the on the website. Okay. Um, and it is a true story that he wants to do that. Okay. But I wrote it and I made sure that everyone knows this will never happen. And now it's like on all these websites, people going like, I wonder if this match is going to take place. It is not going to ever take place. Ever. There's, <laughs> I mean, it makes as much sense as that Ogawa thing with Tyson. It, 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 it's, I don't want to say ever because maybe the day will come where Tyson will need money, but it will never be happen with Tank. It's going to happen. If it's going to happen like that, you know, it will be, you know, someone with like mainstream value like Hulk Hogan or something. Anyway, let's go to Chris. Chris, what's going on? Hi, how's it going? It's going pretty good. I was taking a look at that Russo site uh, for whatever reason. Cause my brother was on it, and um, there's a ga uh, if Brian's been to the site, I don't know if you, there's a game on the site where it's kind of like the whack-a-mole thing that he talked about in the newsletter that time, where there's these top hats and a face pops out, like Goldberg, Russo, Dave Meltzer, Luger, and Miss Elizabeth. And if you click on them, you get a point. If you click on Russo, you lose a point. But if you click on certain ones, you get a point. And I I think if you click on your face, you get like two points or something. I think it's a bonus. Wow. Point. Yeah, I, I think it might it might only be one point. I might have that wrong because I didn't spend a lot of time playing the game. But um, just so you know, he's got you on his site in a hat popping out of a Dave, hat. Dave, you've moved up in the whack a mole world. <laughs> oh my god. Do you still do you still not know what a whack a mole is? I know last time you didn't. I sort of do now. Sort of do. Well, you're part of one of the games online, so. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> I read his commentary too, and uh, he did say that thing about. He says for seven. He said it beat. He said that the the segment beat Raw for seven minutes for every minute, and that um, why don't respectable. This was his kind of snide remark. Why don't respectable journalists ever report this? Check the numbers. They don't lie. Okay. Uh, have you checked the numbers? Have I checked the numbers? No. I'm. Not, I'm I, I don't like Russo, so I could care less. Well, I'm, you can still check the numbers, and they may be true. It may have been true two and a half years it ago, may so be, as, yeah. we said, as we said, or three. Because there was a period when when a lot of WCW segments were beating a lot of WF. Segments. The first I can tell you, I mean, I remember this just because I wrote it when uh, when when Bret Hart retired, and I remember the stat. Steve, there was a, there was a thing where where Rock threw Steve Austin in the um, was it in the bridge over 
in, in, in the bridge or something. The it was a big belt. Steve Austin segment, and it went head to head with Bret Hart. He, he threw the Intercontinental Belt or something over the bridge. Wasn't yeah, it? something like. No, 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 no. He threw a week. He threw the belt off one week, and then he threw Steve Austin off. No, he threw Steve Austin, but he did it face to face. But anyway, he threw oh, that's it. right. Yes. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. yeah. He yeah. threw the he threw Steve Austin into the thing, I think, and then or maybe he threw the belt. I don't remember. But anyway, it went head to head with Bret Hart's. Um, Debut on WCW TV and Bret Hart's debut on WCW TV beat it by I think it was 4.2 to 2.7 were the rating points, but whatever it was, it was by a big, a big substantial margin. And you know what does that mean today? It means I was nothing. just going to say he can say all he wants and pick out all these segments, but the bottom line is you're at the Giants games and w, you know Vince McMahon owns everything. And I <laughs> mean, what, right. what the hell's the point? And he and he and he and he gutted and he gutted that company. Yeah, yeah, it was all. I mean, it's all, and then there's another segment. I don't think he wrote this. I think it was written by somebody like the webmaster maybe or whatever it is all these booking ideas for the new WCW now if you go and read it um, it's it, it's on the main page it says new WCW booking ideas or whatever and there are actually some good ideas I think the guy's name was like Ryan DiBiase or something like that and the thing is when you read them and you think to yourself that this whole website is VinceRusso.org like this tribute to him or whatever it is all these things that are there he could have did when he was there like one of them this big idea is a big Bill Goldberg Mike Awesome program, and that Mike Awesome should be this main eventer, and blah 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 blah. But what the hell did he do with Mike Awesome when he was there? He gave put him in that '70s guy suit. or the fat? No, it was the fat chick thriller. The fat chick thriller, and then the leisure suit. And who the hell was going to take that serious against Goldberg? You know, I, I mean, I, you Nobody. as you read it, you look at it, and you just kind of. And it wasn't Russo saying these are my ideas, but it's somebody on his site, and it's like, I don't know. It just it gets you kind of irritated when you read it. Um, There's a lot of funny things on that website. Yeah, unintentionally too. Um, I mean, some intentionally, maybe some not. Uh, what I wanted to ask you, uh, some a uh, few things about Japan. Cause I got a couple of tapes from Tori Human recently, uh, mm-hmm. and I'm sort of new to following that. So, uh, in at the end of one of the matches, Ultimo Dragon does a run in in a suit and does all these kicks and like kind of clears the ring. I thought he was like in- incapable of of wrestling. Like that's why he was doing kicks. He- well, I mean, but he, he, everything he did was, like, I mean, he didn't do any, I know, I know it was his elbow, like, he, he didn't do any slams or suplexes or anything. He can't do anything with one arm, but he can, he can, yeah, he, was, he can't close his hand or anything like that, but he can, he can still kick. Oh, okay, yeah, because he looked like, he looked great doing everything he did. I'm looking at him like, how's he Yeah, I remember the run, and he did, he did look great, but, but again, yeah, he couldn't do a match, though, I don't think. Oh, okay, that's why I was just curious. Um, and who's Shiru, Shiru, the, I can't get to say his name, Shiru 2? The one that Kazash used to play, the old gimmick he had? Yeah, the new Shiru in Michinoku, I don't know. Oh, okay, because he was pretty good. I just wasn't sure. I mean, I yeah, saw one I'm match sure. with uh, yeah. the Curry Man. It was like a six man with this guy, Jody Fleisch. And there was a mm-hmm. lot of nice spots in that match. I just, I'd never seen him before, so. Um, yeah. And the other thing I was going to ask is a friend of mine was asking me about this. Remember the old Legion of Doom, Powers of Pain, weightlifting angle yes. they did? He yes. wanted to know if um, that was like, if, if they were legit, like, if those guys were lifting what they were saying they were lifting if they were I real believe the weights I believe the weights were legit it was but spotting. Um, okay. I'm I'm trying to remember what the cuz I remember there was a big thing at the time because usually in 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 wrestling in historically the weights had been worked when you right. do stuff like that and I believe when that was going on that those guys wanted the weights to be legit but I don't know how heavy they went cuz Hawk is not a was was not at that time a, and probably never was uh, nearly as strong a bench presser as his legend, as fans would have thought. Uh-huh. So, but Animal was a very strong bencher, and um, you know, I know Warlord was, you know, super strong bencher, and 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 Barbarian probably was pretty strong, five hundred pound or two. So, okay. so um, I think, you know, like the, when they finally piled the weight on and did the angle, I think that the, basically, I think that the weights were real in that segment. Yeah. Okay. Cause, yeah, we were gotten to the discussion about like the like the kind of one you had recently about the strongman in wrestling. So he was asking me about that. Um, are they gonna if they do if they do this tag team main event at WrestleMania? Are they gonna do a stipulation? Because generally, like like tag matches that don't really even though they're big names, uh, they don't seem to like have the interest. You know what I mean? They don't garner the interest from people if there's no title on the line or. I hate that though when they put the title on the line for those matches. So do I. I'm not, like a tag match. Yeah. Where well, maybe maybe they'll like have the Intercontinental, the Intercontinental and the World Title on the line, and then like if like Hunter gets pinned, yeah. then the guy wins the Intercontinental. I could easily see them doing that. Yeah, yes. like they, they did that with like Owen and Bulldog and Yokozuna, some kind of match. Yeah, they, they may do that. But I, I'm thinking the idea is of this match. Just what I'm thinking is that it's to set up a singles with Austin and Undertaker, and if that's the case, then the logical finish would be Austin pinning or getting pinned by Undertaker this time. And to do that, you wouldn't want those titles on the line. 
That's true. You know, because then, yeah. then the whole buildup is just like, okay, then you do the, yeah, the title exactly. match at the next pay-per-view. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, and to, just last thing I want to say, I was reading, uh, reading The Observer lately because I've been, you know, subscribing to it regularly, and it's, you do, I can't even, I'm still, I still have things to finish reading. There's so much stuff in there. It's just, well, you do a great job with that. Um, Thanks. I, I read things and just learn things as I go along. Even federations, you know, in other countries I don't follow, but, you know, I know a little bit about it. It just, it helps with a lot of the information. And figure four, too, is just, it's, just it's too funny. It really is. The, the, it is too funny. The WrestleMania uh, recap he did where he just goes off on China. I couldn't stop laughing. I mean, <laughs> and it was like more serious than I'm just sitting there laughing about how he said, oh, at least save You know, the, the funniest thing about, about Brian's stuff is, is even though it's like, it's funny, mm. but it's like it's true funny as opposed oh, yeah, to yeah. just like trying, like, like, it's just trying, trying to, to make like, a stupid know, joke. Trying to make yeah. jokes, it's like there's always a meaning to the joke rather than just a joke there to be funny and no with no purpose. Right, exactly. That's what, like I, I read his year in review that you always raved about. He actually well, that was awesome. Me. That the lines about Russo, how he swerved his wife by picking up orange juice instead of milk when she had <laughs> those. I, it was just that was that was great. But I just I thought that was funny as hell. And then how they had the big plan, how Bischoff and Russo had a big plan with all these wrestling minds to make uh, 60 million dollars in nine months but Russo convinced Bischoff that we should swear everybody and actually lose 60 million dollars in nine months I just, was some of the funniest stuff I've ever read uh, so I'm just plugging that and uh, kissing a little ass and letting everybody know they should uh, subscribe to both of those newsletters and uh, that's it thanks right, okay um, we're, the contest Russo was talking about was in September of 2000 it was when raw it was it was uh, I think September 25th 2000. Um, which opened with Austin's first interview after a long absence, and then they did the bikini contest. It was the one that Pamela Paulshock pulled the power play to win. So anyway, oh, look is up that the, the one comparison. He's talking about? Yeah, so look up the comparison quarter hours. It'd be the uh, September 25th, I believe, would be the day, although it's not here. I'm guessing that that's the date. So um, of 2000. Exactly. In fact, I'm, the quarter hours we were referring to were 4.81 for Raw and 3.11 for Nitro. So that's <laughs> the end of that. What? What about that seven minutes though? Okay, whatever. <laughs> I'm sure that that's about what they were. Uh, let's see. Any chance that Ben Jericho will team up long term and compete in the tag team division? They could freshen up the division. It'd be nice to see the tag straps on someone new. Plus, a feud with Edge and Christian would be great. Actually, Ben One Jericho and Edge Christian would be good. I think that it would take them down though, because the tag team division in WWF has never been a main event division, and it'll kind of like um, I wouldn't. I mean, if it was if it was old style 1980s wrestling. I wouldn't mind it because you could have like two singles guys going to tag team for the world tag team titles, like the old NWA style, so to speak, and it would be good and it would elevate, you know, it would elevate everyone. But but for Benoit and Jericho to become a regular tag team and feud with Edge and Christian, even if they would get the, the tag team titles, it's actually a step downward. By the way, the WF does business, so I don't want to see it because I don't want to see them take the step downward. I mean, look at Undertaker uh, and Kane. Well, they're like you know two top guys tag team. If they face under, or Edge and Christian, they just kill them. Yep, and I think they have actually many times. I think I think Undertaker by himself has a few times too. Yes. Would Scott Steiner, Kevin Nash, or Bill Goldberg be huge in Japan? Um, Scott Steiner was a real big star in Japan for years and years. Um, you know, because of his athletic ability and everything, he's much bigger now. Um, I mean, he would get over because he's part of their culture, you know, and everything like that. I don't know that. His matches would obviously not be as good as they were, you know, not even close. I mean, he actually had good matches, really good matches there. Um, Kevin Nash, I don't think so. I don't think that he would do well there. Um, and Bill but Goldberg. But he's tall. He is tall and he's big. I just don't think it would, but Sid Vicious never did well there. Yeah. So it's just that size alone, although Norton did. You know, it's a matter how, you, how you're pushed, I guess. I don't think that, that Nash would do well there. As far as Goldberg... Um, certainly the first time he would do real well just because it's Bill Goldberg and the people would, like, make a big deal out of it. Um, long term, if he was there all the time, I don't think it would work out very well. But as a special guest, maybe three times a year, I think he could do very well. It's from Ben Miller who goes, oh, what are TNN's ratings for early Saturday evenings? I don't know. If the WF wants to attract an audience, it seems that getting an early evening Saturday time slot might help keep some of the WCW fans who used to watch WCW Saturday night. Yeah, I, I think that's a, I think that that, like, Old WCW Saturday Night Time slot is preferable to the one they're getting. I know this isn't going to happen right away because the time slot is set, but I'm curious if you know what kind of ratings they get at that time. You know, again, I don't, I don't know I don't the answer. It's so much set yet. It's not etched in. It's not like it can't be changed. Yeah. The thing is, is that a lot of people keep looking at his ratings, and you, and 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 with wrestling, and not even just with wrestling. You know, ratings, ratings are 
are only a tool to determine what advertisers are going to spend. And it really doesn't matter because if they can get a show that does an 0.7 and an advertiser will spend more money on that show than a wrestling show that does a 2.0, the station will go with the 0.7 in more, more cases than not. And, I mean, we've seen this many times in the past. We just saw it with, um, with WCW. I mean, the fact is the, the show that they're replacing Nitro with did a lower rating than Nitro, but they're probably making more money at it. The dog show on USA always generated them way more money than Raw ever did, which is why they used to replace it, even though there were year, you know, there were years the dog show beat Raw and there were years that, the, that Raw beat the dog show. But it's, it's, it, you know, it's like, hey, they're, not the the end, they're not like the end of the, you know, the end of the story anyway. I mean, if they did like a, a 1.5 rating, and they could still tour and make money and do an occasional pay-per-view and make money, then the rating really doesn't mean anything. Yeah. Yeah, if, uh, yeah. Let's see. Um, this goes, this is regarding Mick Foley, who he's upset at WrestleMania. He goes, um, I suspect you're right about The Rock, because Foley has publicly said he was really upset with The Rock, both beating on him so much, and then not asking him backstage if he was sure that was okay. Now, that would have been, that would have been Royal Rumble yeah. the year before. So that's not necessarily the same thing. I know that Foley was a little bit unhappy that he praised Rock in his book. And then when in Rock's book, which was this self-centered masterpiece, the only guys that Rock really praised, if you read the book, were like, uh, I mean, he praised Bret Hart and he praised Austin, and, and he didn't really praise Foley. So I mm -hmm. think there was a little, you know, but I don't know if that has to do with WrestleMania. Uh, what are Japan contracts like? Could Dota bring in someone like Kawada? If they want, if they want to pay anyone enough money, they can get anyone they want. They got the money. It's, it's, you know, yeah. I don't think they want Kawada. I don't think they want Japanese guys because Kawada works stiff and that's not their style. Uh, do you think it would work? I'd love to see Helmsley against Kawada. Again, it's different style. Um, I think they're both good enough workers. They'd probably have a really good match. But, you know, Helmsley's, uh, it's, it, it's like, you know, the Kawada style, again, is no, is non-gimmick, you know, and, and Helmsley, what he does, you know, to get over in matches is, you know, good use of foreign objects, breaking tables. It's like, it's not even, it's, it's something different. They're both great workers, but it's not the same thing. Yeah. Um, is there a, is there any hope for WoW survival at all? It was the only wrestling show besides SmackDown I could get in a cableless household. Long term, um, as far as making money, I mean, it's like if someone wants to pump money into something forever, it can always survive. But as far yeah. as being a profitable entity, no. There's no chance for that as a profitable entity. Uh, let's see. This is somewhat an unimportant question, but what do you call wrestlers if you talk to them backstage? Say if you saw Triple H backstage, would you call him Hunter or Paul? Um, I don't I think know him. We would call him Hunter. But but I yeah I would I would say Hunter. Most case unless it's someone unless it's someone it's that you know. Weird. For, it kind of depends on everybody. Yeah, it depends on who you know where you know him. If it's if it's someone. It's like when it comes to a wrestler, if it's someone that you've known for a long, long time, you usually call him by the first name they used when you knew him. Um, but, um, you know, like, I can't even say that. Most, I mean, most of the time, if, if I get a, a, a message just from, from a wrestler, in 99 times out of 100, they leave their stage name. It's not, they don't leave their real name. So, yeah. that's just how it is. You become your character. Uh, do you think something like a WF pay-per-view on free TV will ever happen? No, because it would then be a free TV show. It can't be a pay-per-view. Uh, anyway, this is someone, Iron Man, most matches. Here's, here's a guy with, with a list. Paraguayo, number one. Could be number one. Ric Flair, number two. Jerry Lawler, number three. That's a good one. Lawler's That's a good true. one, too. Yeah. Uh, Bill Dundee, he's, he's never retired. And he worked, you know, all the, he worked a full schedule. Gypsy Joe, I don't think... I don't think Gypsy Joe, um, although he, I, I, I mean, I don't know. And then Mil Mosqueras, who, Mil Mosqueras never worked like, you know, eight, nine matches a week in, in, in Mexico. I think that there's Mexican wrestlers like Lismark and stuff that worked a lot more than Mil Mosqueras. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so, I mean, like, you know, Mil Mosqueras had always slowed down by 79. Uh, what are the chances of Tank Abbott fighting in mixed martial arts if his pro wrestling career is over? Uh, I think that he'll try, and I don't think it depends, well, it depends on who they put against him, but it's, um, May not be good. Um, okay, then, then he goes, um, there's a Monday Nitro on March 22nd, 1999, okay, where Nitro had a bikini thing, and there was Raw that night, but Steve Austin did not ever go head-to-head -head with a bikini thing. So that's the other one. The one that, that's the one with Victoria Wilson where Kevin Nash said, eat your heart out. 
Okay. So, That's what I figured okay. he was talking about, but I didn't know he was talking about with Austin returning that night. Yeah. Well, that would, no, it would have been the September 25th. That was when Austin returned. Yeah. Remember that? Because, they, yeah, so, so yeah, it didn't even come close. Like anything uh, was even coming close in 2000. Nothing. Yeah. Yeah. This is from someone who says, I was listening to the law last night, and Jeff said Big Boss Man was going to be Regal's bodyguard. I didn't know that, but, you know, oh Jeff's got... God. Why? Yeah. Yeah, I had heard they wanted, we're going to put David Taylor in some spots similar to that, so who knows. Uh, but, you know, Jeff's got pretty good sources in WF. I, I would guess it's probably true. Let's go to Phil in D.C. Phil, what's up? Hey, guys, i got a uh, bunch of little different things you guys have talked about. Um, okay. Another person for maybe Iron Man, El Satanico. He's been wrestling since 73. Absolutely. Good good, good pick because he's probably been wrestling seven, eight, you know, seven, eight matches a week for that whole period. <laughs> and um, I don't remember any injuries. Um, yeah, I think that's a, that's a good pick. And he's just a pretty good worker, too, I mean, for a guy that, for a guy, I guess, I'm looking at his he's birthday, 50, was 49, 50, so 50, 50, 50 year old wrestler. He's, well, yeah, he's 50 now. Yeah. Oh, no, no, he's 51. He's 51 because he was born in 49. Right. And he's, yeah, so born late 49, so yeah, he'd be 51 years old. Yeah, so I mean, for somebody that, I think over 50 wrestlers, maybe him and Grand Hamada. How about Grand Hamada? But Grand Hamada stopped. The schedule, huh? Yeah, Grand Hamada stopped working that schedule many, many years ago, whereas Satanico never stopped. Right. Um, a couple of other things. I was go back to that Vince Russo uh, thing God. that everybody's talking about. But the, the, the most amusing thing I thought on this rant you guys haven't even mentioned yet, uh, where he talked about, uh, and I quote here, other things of note. I'm close to signing a deal where I would be booking a few shows overseas oh, throughout yes. the year. Hopefully, these shows will be on pay per view. So I was thinking, you know, you were, I was reading the result of that New Japan paper. Oh, maybe he booked me for Super Booker. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was an okey. That explains it. <laughs> yeah, I know, really. Yeah, we're going to shoot a big angle during the commercial. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like it. I mean, oh only if, you God. know, Kira Hokuto ran out at, during the Katsuki Sasaki match and took her top off or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, a little addition. <laughs> oh, my God. It, it turned on him for no reason. That. Yeah, <laughs> and then they were together the next week. Saying right. it was all a swerve. Uh, oh, uh, Shiryu you too. Um, yeah. is it was fantastic. Who's a uh, Mexican luchador who works who worked a lot of big Japan dates. Okay, so I, I know the name Fantastic, and I've seen him as Fantastic before. Right. Okay, I didn't know they were the same. So that's guy. who he worked as Shiryu too. And that match, I guess the guy's name was Chris, right? That he was talking about. Was on twelve twenty one nineteen ninety nine, mm-hmm. and was sure you two Minoru Fujita Jody Fleish against uh, Sima Curry Man and Superboy. Have you seen that match? I don't know. It's, I've seen I, a lot of Michinoku. I mean, I've seen. Oh, I, I may have was because there was a match I saw with Superboy that was like out of this world it, with with, with uh, Curry Man as a team. I remember yeah. that from. So I may have seen that match. It, it made our it made the Death Valley Driver uh, two hundred matches of the of the decade. It was probably for pure spot fest, maybe the best one I've ever seen. As far as like the spots they were doing were so high level, they didn't blow anything. I mean, the finish was amazing. Uh, Jody Fleish is really he's not a great wrestler, but like a really good flyer. Um, did a leap onto the top rope to do his shooting star press to the floor springboard, and Chris Daniels in the Caribbean outfit leaped up. Landed on the top rope with him and gave him like a, uh, Uranagi off the top rope to the, to the back of the mat. That was like amazing. Yeah, those guys were nuts. Yeah, I mean, just like the balance <laughs> that took. And, yeah. uh, I mean, so well, if you haven't seen that match, it's game. really worth, ch- like, tracking it down. But that sounds like something like if either guy slipped, they would both be dead. Oh, yeah. Totally. <laughs> I would, uh, it's not worth it. <laughs> no, they would totally just kill themselves. Um, one of the people I think they mentioned whether any, uh, you talked about guys who would be ready to be brought up is I think uh, Joey Apps is a good enough he, worker, good. at least from the stuff I've seen back he when he worked with the Hardys. Of, yeah, he doesn't have a lot of charisma, though. They'd have to give him, like, a good gimmick. Yeah, he had a good one when he was in Omega. Give a sweater I mean, vest back. No, nah, that's, like, ancient. Oh, that was horrible. But you he, know the thing with Joey Abs is that no one realizes because he was doing the sweater vest gimmick? He's huge. Yeah, he's, he's enormous. Like, I, 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 I oh, used to go to those like Omega his, shows. He's got to be 6'5". You know, 280 or something like that. Yeah, he's got. I mean, he's. That's what I was thinking. Is like close to 280, and he's got these giant pecs and shoulders. He looks like um, like a bigger Hercules Hernandez. Yeah. I mean, like with that that kind of a, like totally blown up guy that like no one realizes because he did the sweater vest gimmick. Yeah, that was such a career killer. But I mean, he used to work in Omega with like all the the Hardys and all those guys. So he's really good at wrestling smaller wrestlers. Like he had really great matches with Champagne, who's got to be 
uh, like 5'10", 180 pounds, and he had good matches with guys like Shannon Moore and, and Jeff Hardy, and he's really good I, at I, working smaller guys for something that think big. They had a SmackDown taping, I think it was the Oakland Coliseum, um, but him and S.A. Rios had a, um, I, I don't know if it was a, sma a, a heat match or a dark match, but it was the best match on the entire show. Yeah, you know, he worked real well with S.A. Rios. You know, yeah. like uh, I still like the idea so much of putting guys like that that people remember as like you know the guy from the Mean Street Posse with the new WCW crew. I think they should take some guys and elevate them from WWF and put them over there, and then bring some of those guys like Joey Abs up to WWF. Well, I mean, you could repackage them. I mean, I you know, there's just a certain percentage yeah, I mean, of the audience pays a lot of attention to wrestling. People like recognize. I mean, do you really think people, were, the average fan, really remembers that Mean Street Posse gimmick from two years ago? I mean, yeah, they it do, seems like the kind of thing that we forgot. No, they, 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 Phil, I swear to God they do, because when I was at, um, at that same taping I'm talking about, when they played that music, it wasn't even the guys. The people popped like crazy, <laughs> like these stars had come back, and it was, you know, Rodney. <laughs> Oh, man, he, was, so bad. he wasn't that good. But uh, actually, was in, fact, in fact, he actually, I think he wrestled Raven, and I think I think it was Raven, but whatever it was, they had like this incredibly horrible match. Oh, I know. I keep. I, I, I'm not going to. I'm, I'm not going to defend the Mean Street Posse again. I think you took <laughs> me to task last time I tried that. And I was. We were talking about Kevin Nash in Japan. You were talking about Kevin Nash in Japan, and the mm -hmm. first tape I ever reviewed for the Death Valley Drive was maybe two years ago. It was a Best of Jushin Liger tape. Oh, the and tag it, match with El Gigante, right? No, no, it was Jushin Liger and Kevin Nash's Oz against Hiro Saito and Scott Norton. And it's as good as you'd expect oh. it to be. Oh, my God. And he came out with the gimmick, like the hat and the, the like, mask. Oh, my God. Dyed hair. And he worked he worked in that match, and then they showed clips of a match earlier. What kind of reaction did he get coming out in that outfit? Deafening. No, they no, Japan. Really? No. No. <laughs> No, they were say just that's like, what you can do this? again. Who is this big goof in a clown suit? That's what they were thinking. <laughs> exactly, but they had shown clips. That's what they were thinking here when he came out like that, too. <laughs> <laughs> but they showed clips of, like, a dream match, and I really wish I had a, the match full on tape, where it was him, Oz, in a singles match against Shinya Hashimoto. And the clips they showed were just Shinya Hashimoto kicking his lungs out. <laughs> <It was> great. <laughs> like, I wish I, you know, I had the whole match on tape, and I wish they'd run it again today. And, and where'd you get the Sano tape, Dave? Because I, 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 all I heard around the, the internet that was that that show was untaped. That is what I heard on the internet. But I got I got a tape express mailed to me this morning, and I I know it's that match because I watched about two minutes of it. So um, so uh, someone def someone definitely taped it. Yeah. All right, so I'm gonna have to search it out then because I did hear it was. Is it a handheld? Yeah, it's a handheld. Yeah, they didn't tape it for television or anything like that. Okay, cool. So it so it exists out there. So. It Absolutely, absolutely exists. Yes. Excellent. Well, watch it and tell, tell me whether it's worth you know spending my time and energy searching it down. Okay, I'm going to watch that whole card probably tonight after Raw, so tomorrow on the show I'll let you know. Excellent. Okay, great. Good okay. talk to you guys. Well, also, I want to make mention that on the site right now, there's a TV review of um, Jacked by Nilton Fernandez of Winnipeg, and it's really funny. I mean, it was like it was like as, as good as some of your stuff, Brian. Did you see? Did, did you, you see, have you seen that one yet? No, what? I haven't seen it. You should look. It's it's a crack up. He's really funny. Anyway, um, let me get to a couple of these emails and we'll get back to phone calls. Uh, what do you consider the best ring entrances of all time? What best ring entrances? It says vintage Ric Flair, Undertaker of the '90s, Shawn Michaels, Goldust, Gangrel, Michael Hayes with the Freebirds, DX. God, it's so different. Um, I mean, I remember when the DX thing in late. Uh, what would this be? Late about 1997. Um, I mean, as far as crowd noise, Anoki and The Rock, of course, or Steve Austin. Yeah. But I mean, as far as elaborate, the oh, was it Anoki or Mudo? Some guy came out. I think it was Anoki, and they had the big harp playing his song at one of the dome shows. I think that mm -hmm. might have been the best. I don't remember if it was Anoki or, or or Great Muda, but it was. I think that was one of the best ring entries I ever saw. Um. Definitely not Godfather when, uh, who was that guy at that WrestleMania, not this year, but last year? That was awful. Oh, my God, when he rapped the song for him? Oh, my God, yeah. That was horrible. Yeah. Even, like, that DX band, when they played uh, Shawn Michaels' music live for that one, uh, the DX pay-per-view. That was pretty horrible. I thought that was okay. Really? Sometimes yeah. live bands are right, but sometimes I think they're just, like, <laughs> we talked about the Godfather. That was just hideous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Michaels... Michaels used to have a really cool ring entrance. The um, first Goldust time DX did their ring entrance with the music and everything. 
Yeah, now when I I remember this is ninety seven when the first time they did that, and I I remember yeah, watching awesome. it going like, going like, the this is going to change wrestling. I remember I, I tell, told me that when I saw, I saw that ring entrance, the way they you know flashed all that stuff together and with the song, it's like this is it. This is like they they found it. You know, I knew it. They found it, and it was like WCW is in more trouble than they think because this one WCW was like just killing them, and mm -hmm. um, eventually that turned out to be the case. But yeah, that was. I, thought, I don't know, to me, that hit me really strong. Um, Undertaker, I mean, it's real elaborate theatrical thing with all the druids on the big shows, but I never really got into that one as much as, like, the Michaels ring entrances were real good. The Goldust was a big production. Gangrel, I mean, coming from the bottom. Is this, didn't, Canyon, they were going to do that with Canyon, right? In I think he did come up from the stage one time. It's like he did, like, two or three appearance. times right at the end. It wasn't final as good appearance, as Gangrel, he got a hell of an entrance, and then it was all over. Yeah. Hayes, um... Freebird ring entrance was, was really, really good. When they had the, of course, it's, it's a different era, but when they had, like, those Confederate capes and everything on some of the big shows in Dallas, yeah. Um, it's from John Popo, who goes, lots of people seem to forget ECW started out as a regional promotion, but a new promotion would be better off starting in a small market and building their product instead of trying to launch nationally. Yes, um, I would I would agree. Not so much because they, they wouldn't, I don't think they would be able to make money on a regional basis, but what I think is good is that you'd lose less, and also, you'd be able to, if you did, like, a regional company, in fact, I, I even, like, suggested this to people if they want to start something up, is that you, you get, like, a local thing, and you run regionally four or five nights a week for a year, so the guys are all ready, and then when you go on national TV, you know what you're doing rather than go on, like, do the XFL gimmick where you're on na national TV, you have no idea what you're doing, and then five weeks later, go, oh, please give us another chance after everyone's tuned off, yeah. you know? So, yeah, I would think I would you think, should. I would think it would be a good idea, too, if you're doing that sort of thing, to... Do a lot of tapings where you're doing it, even if you don't have TV, but you do a lot of tapings where it's live to tape, where everybody has time cues, and the show has to end at a certain time, and everything has to be, you know, so when you're ready for TV, when you go out there, you're not running long or running short or having guys not know what to do when you go, you know, 30 seconds, go home or whatever. I think it's important that a company does that to prepare for TV as opposed to just being, you know, left in the dark. UPW is doing that now. Yeah, it's a good you know, idea. I mean, they, 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 run, they run it like it's tele, like it's a raw show. Yep. You know, where, I mean, where you don't even need TV to do it. Just have a guy back there with a stopwatch. Yeah, well, they, they, they tape it. They're just, you know, I don't know what they... Well, they do it, actually, they do it for a live web, webcast is actually how they do it. Yeah. So, I, I want to make mention, I, just, I have not mentioned, men, mentioned this, but um, as best, I believe that Ken Shamrock will not be on the show tomorrow, but he will be on a week from tomorrow. So that, but that's all being worked out, or, or will be worked out probably the next day. So I just wanted to get that out. I um, hope it's worked out the next day. Yeah, I know. Russell, we just won't have him on. It's tomorrow. <laughs> that would be the first time. Yeah, really. Don't forget the great time slot WCW will get on the West with its Saturday night time slot. Actually, TNN is a staggered feed, so it's the exact same time slot on the West Coast. Yeah. Uh, 11 to 1. Um, unless you got a dish. If you got a dish, you can watch it at 8, which actually is what I will do. Uh, in WCW, when NWO was created, I heard it was from All Japan and New Japan and an angle that Bischoff heard about. Actually, it was New Japan, New Japan and, and UWFI. UWFI. Yeah, and Bischoff went to a pay-per-view um, at the Tokyo Dome, and, and it was sold out. I, don't, I forget which one it was. I think it was the... I think it was... They, they did three big ones, and I don't remember which one, again, that he was at, but he saw it. The heat was incredible. And he was like, like 67,000 people there. Well, there was three of them, and they all sold out. The first one, the first Mudo Takata was like 67, and then the last two were both... Were like. They had one. They had the Mudo Takata rematch that did like 64, 65, and then they had the Hashimoto Takata where Hashimoto beat Takata for the title, and that was like 64 also. So they had three three straight sellouts at the Tokyo Dome. And um, I can just see Bischoff there, like the front row with the gear spinning, seeing all these people in the crowd, and that's where it started. You know, JJ saw the same thing. Remember, you know the story there, right? Oh yeah. JJ went to the Tokyo Dome when they did the. Um, it was the Ogawa Murakami against Hashimoto and Azuka, Azuka match from. January 4th, 2000, Tokyo Dome. And this was right when they were trying to get rid of bit, um, Russo. And JJ came back, and it was like, he saw, you know, that had incredible heat. When I, I remember when I saw that, it was the same feeling. When I saw that match, it was the same feeling I had when I watched the DX thing we talked about. Totally different things, but I watched that and go, this is something so totally different, and it's really, really good. Except for the DX thing, you can do that ring entrance 52 weeks a year on TV. This kind of a match, you can only do so often. But yeah. if, my, the whole thing is you got to, you know, if you know when to do it, it was just such an awesome style of work that I'd never seen before, you know, kind of a work shoot thing with really brutal punches and everything that everyone mm -hmm. believed and the heat was out of this world. So J.J. comes back with that and, like, 
had no idea what he saw, but he knew he saw something really good, and and <laughs> you know never they actually then like he watched came TV up with, and saw a bunch of uh, one minute matches with uh, Oklahoma, and he said something's got to change. Yeah, I know. So so anyway, they they all started working on like ideas, and by the time they got there, I think um, you know. I don't know. They just did beat Tank Abbott with a crossface. They didn't know who they were. When they played uh, um, Jim Ross's music on SmackDown, were you afraid that Oklahoma was going to come out? Yes. <laughs> you know. Yes. You know what else kind of is so horrible? But I was at a gymnastics meet two weeks ago, and I'm standing there, and they do the national anthem, and I'm sitting there, and I'm looking at the flag, and they're playing the music. And you and think I swear to you, I was waiting for MIA's music to play. Oh. I saw for sure that something was going to happen. It was going to get interrupted. Yeah. Yeah, the, uh, the 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 Canadians are going to attack the Patriot. That's right. Um, yeah, when is Bret Hart going to write a book on his career? He's actually doing that right as we speak. Uh, where are Barry Orton, Jerry Allen, and Bob Bradley these days? Jerry Allen died, who's Jerry Oski, died many years ago of a heart attack when he was 32 years old. Um, Barry Orton is living in Las Vegas, and I don't know what he's doing. He was going to write a book, but he never did. And Bob Bradley... And he's still writing it. Uh, yeah, maybe. Bob Bradley, I have no idea whatever happened to Bob Bradley. This is from somebody who goes, MattRats.com is awesome. I don't care that it's Backstreet, style, Backstreet Boys style. The high spots are insane. I think that they would move right into the number two slot. I wouldn't go that far, but I, I, I enjoyed it. It was good, good, you know. Uh, let's see. Seriously, is there any pro wrestling in China? Um, there have been um, occasional shows. <laughs> There have been occasional shows there by Japanese promotions, but uh, they don't have any like um, they don't have any like circuits or anything like that, as far as I know of. Let's go to uh, Curtis in California. Curtis, what's going on? Hello. Hey, hey, how are you? I'm fine. I was I was wondering what's going on with Raven and this whole Christ thing. Because I remember when I used to see when ECW used to say stuff like I've been crucified for my sins and stuff. Yeah, he did say that. I guess he can't say that in WWF. Will come. He even got crucified. Yeah, they get, they'll get like crucified. That. <laughs> and he comes out with his arms, like, you know, all on the side, like a cross. Yeah, like like crucified, yeah. That's yeah. just his gimmick. It's but, not, it's got nothing to do with Jesus Christ being crucified. It's the raven pose. Oh. I was wondering, like, remember that. Uh, it's not like that the Undertaker old... symbol. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's not a cross, <laughs> it's a symbol. Yeah. I, was, I had, like, two comments about WrestleMania. I thought mm -hmm. that TLC match sucked. It was like too really? quick. Too oh, quick. Fifteen minutes is long enough. Those guys were going to die <laughs> if they went too much longer. I know. I'm watching it right now because I taped it. I was, that battle royal, that gimmick battle royal. You guys remember that wrestler named Tatanka? Yes. I thought he was going to come out. I was so happy. Remember that one uh, black guy who came out? His music sounds similar, and I thought he was going to come out. I was hella mad. Oh. Oh well. I'm black guy. Oh well, they couldn't. They couldn't find him. They couldn't? They were looking for him, though? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, he didn't have the right friends. What can I say? Uh, he could have brought back guys Johnson. Pick... He'd have killed everyone in the ring. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody would have to have, like, their, like, liver removed and stuff by the end, right? Oh, yeah, but uh, besides... Remember that guy? Uh, oh, my... <sighs> what's going on with uh, Raven's career? Uh, nothing. <laughs> he's just there, you know? He's there, and he's not going to complain, because if he, he did... He lost to Maine clean on Sunday Night Heat. That should tell you something. Yeah. I know, I so he... that... Because I heard he's, like, all sloppy now. Because I was reading about him in WOW magazine. Uh -huh. And they said he was, like, all sloppy in ECW. And, you know, he's making He was out of shape in ECW, for sure. Yeah. And the many, he, 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 he wasn't jokes. very good in ECW towards the end, you know, so. Oh, so didn't he hold the belt, the ECW title, for, like, a year? I think so, yeah. I think he did at one point, yeah. Yeah, I was mad when he lost, uh... United States belt after one night because he won it from DDP at Spring Stampede and then he lost the next night to Goldberg. Yeah, I can't, isn't it funny how that works out? So, actually, in hindsight, <laughs> how about that? Yeah, it sounds like when I when I hear that story, it sounds like DDP was pretty smart. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't even think about that but at the time, actually. No, but you know what? I, I mean, I remember the you know Raven and Goldberg. That was a phenomenal piece of business. You remember oh, yeah. all those run-ins and everything? That was one of the real high points of Goldberg's career, I think, was that match. Whole flock ran in. Well, yeah, he what? Just killed everybody. What match was that? The Goldberg was the one match. the next night that you were talking yeah, the about? Next, this, yeah. Oh, I only, oh yeah, the whole flock. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
All right, well, we're going to get running, okay? Huh? We're going to get running, okay? Okay, let's go to, is it Tom in Connecticut? Hey, how are you guys doing? We're hey. doing really good. Um, I want to, you know, talk about how uh, WCW is going to be with WWF now. Yes. Okay. And all the d good things they could do with it. They could do a lot of good things. Like I'm thinking part. really off the bat is Chavo Guerrero and Test. Cause, uh, okay. Test. <laughs> <laughs> See ya. How about China and Sean Stasiak? <laughs> no, because no, cause Chavo, um, Test and Eddie had the feud and it was really good. And Chavo's even better than Eddie, I believe. Yeah, but he's even smaller, too. That's the problem. Do, do you know how big a size difference there is with Test and... and yeah, it's what about Nash and Rey Mysterio, 99? Yeah, that, that was a disaster, too. <laughs> I know, I'm just kidding about that one. But the, really, another one is uh, Taz and Reno, both pretty around the same size, if you think size is a factor. Reno's a pretty decent worker. I'd like to, I hope that Reno gets a shot there. He doesn't seem to have a lot of charisma, but I always thought he was pretty good. And... um. Yeah, Taz and Reno. I think Reno's probably a couple inches bigger than Taz. What about uh, Tommy Dreamer? Do you think maybe he could be in it? Because I was thinking a good thing for him is if they put it like a manager with him, like Francine. But instead of Francine, it'd be like Medusa. Oh God, I don't I think, think Medusa will ever see television for the rest. I don't think Medusa. I think Medusa's days are over. I don't think they're looking for forty-year-old women in that company. She's forty. Uh, believe her real age is right around forty. Yeah, maybe. Plus, maybe she 39. trashed that title. And you, and you guys are talking about some of the best entrances. Mm -hmm. And one that comes to mind for me is definitely um, Crush. Crush. I thought it was a good one because if you look back, if you were at watching old event, his music was very good. Crush when he was with DOA. No, Crush when it was with um, you know Alicia. Hawaiian like da na 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 na. Oh, when he was doing the when he was feuding with Randy Savage. Yes. No, no, no. Before that, when he was uh, when he was uh, orange and uh, blonde. Yeah, yeah, I remember Crush, crush Orange and head Blonde. With his grip. Did, yeah, you said Crush people's like, heads, yes. Were you Crush people's heads? The coconut finish? crush or something? Yes, the cr cranium crunch. Yeah, yes. oh, yeah, I remember him. His music was crunch. incredible. The Kona Crunch. Kona Crunch, yeah. 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 And what happened to his career? But that music <laughs> was great. They should give it to someone else this, this these days. Uh, let's see if they could find... Maybe they'll give it to that, that rock imitator. If you, Brian, you know about the rock imitator they Who, got? Booker T? Oh, yeah, he was... Is it Booker T, the rock imitator? Rally. He was shorter, but oh, bodybuilder I, type. I, he, I saw him on the Ohio Valley like a week or two ago. It is so scary. This guy, he looks more like the rock than the rock, if that's possible. What about possible. Booker T? Doesn't he look like the rock sometimes? <laughs> no, he looks nothing he looks like, the, like rock. the rock. He just copies the rock. the rock shirt and his miniature. That's about it. Yeah, what yeah, but, you know? What I was thinking also is what they could do is do the uh, with uh, Shane Douglas and Bam Bam Bigelow and Chris Candidi could be the um, triad. I wouldn't. I have uh, uh, Chris Candido is going to be there. I don't think Shane Douglas is going to be there, and I don't like Bam Bam Bigelow oh, either. Oh, because I was going to say feud with DX, the new DX with uh, Albert. <laughs> I don't think that one's going to happen. Uh, it would be good matches for Survivor Series too. Uh, I don't think so. Anyway, we got to get running, okay? All right. Good night. Okay, okay. Those are some great That's, ideas. Oh, God. On a day like today, I wish <laughs> that there was a, still a WCW live show. So anyway, uh, let me get to a couple more emails. Uh, when Shawn Michaels was training for the Iron Man match, was Jose Lothario a gimmick? <laughs> or was he Shawn's real-life mentor? <laughs> um, he, he was, was a gimmick. Um, I mean, no, Jose Lothario was uh, Shawn's original I trainer. How can, you, how can a person be a gimmick? Uh, Ed Leslie. I mean, Hulk Hogan. <laughs> and Oki. Uh, let's see. What are <laughs> what are ring rats called in Mexico? I have no idea. Uh, they are uh, called um. Oh God, ratas. I don't even know. I I, I, I should ask. Are. Really? Yeah. Are you serious? Okay. I don't know. Okay. What was the name of the Mexican wrestler buried wearing his mask? Um, El Santo was buried wearing his mask. I Lots think that's probably who you think. What? Lots of them. Blue Demon. But, yeah. Um. <laughs> Since most of today's wrestling audience has only been watching for three years, do you think WF could reissue some old gimmicks from the past? I could really dig a new slick managing Paul White as the new Akeem. <laughs> That's so funny. Just thinking about it, he'd probably be pretty funny at it too, because he's got How about a good sense of humor. the old slick <laughs> managing the new. You know, um, by the way, Paul White's going to have an interview on WrestlingObserver.com this coming Wednesday. It's actually, if you read it, it's actually pretty good. I read most of it, yeah. yeah. I was actually scanning for my own name first, but... 
and it wasn't there. I just had to make sure. Ric Flair has said if he doesn't go to the WF that he and Arn Anderson may open up a regional promotion in Charlotte. If he does, do you think it would succeed? I sure hope so. I just happened to say. As a small regional? Might yeah. be okay. Um, succeed as far I, as becoming huge and going up against WWF now. Um, I think the odds of this happening are very, very slim. What, what actually, what, what it is is if, okay, and this is actually how, how was, okay. If Ric Flair doesn't go to WWF, which is most, more, which is most likely going to happen, that he's not going to go. And if he is given, if he's let out of his contract to, to work independence by WCW, which is most likely also not going to happen, um, then he would theoretically go and, uh, you know, but it's not going to happen because if he can work elsewhere, he's going to go to WWF. And if he can't work yes. elsewhere, he's, he's not going to do the independent. And as far as starting the own independent, I know that David Crockett, um, I know David Crockett, who's been in wrestling his entire life, would love to start an independent promotion. And maybe they, and they, they may very well do that. They may very well try. Um, and, you know, but I don't think he'll be able to wrestle because all those guys that are under WCW deals have been told that the minute you wrestle any independent show, we're breaching your contract. And he's got 800 a year for two years, and he ain't going to breach that. Yeah. Uh, this is from John, who says, uh, Some years ago when Ken Patera returned to the WWF, he did an interview with Bobby Heenan in the ring where Heenan's words were bleeped, and there was a trailer across the screen saying something effective. They were censored. They were censoring his vile accusations. Since it had been admitted and publicized that Patera had been in prison, what was the deal? It was just like comedy. You know, that they just thought it would be really funny to say, that, like, Bobby Heenan was slandering him. And by editing it out, he could say, you know, you could just use your imagination as opposed to, like, what he actually was saying. Uh, let's see. I already know about... Yeah, we, already, we already looked at the rating of that, that Raw and Nitro when everyone... Anyway, let's see. WF seems to be getting more and more short-term in its storylines. Yeah, everyone in wrestling is, without building much continuity for later on. For example, have they forgotten about Stephanie's missing night with Kurt Angle from last year? I know. They sure <laughs> have. Yeah, I hate the fact that I've become addicted to a soap opera as well as a wrestling, but it bugs me when I remember the things that are forgotten by the writers. Yeah, they kind of forgot about that whole angle. This is from, um, what the hell is Russo talking about? <laughs> oh, we're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to have a lot of fun with Russo as long as he keeps his mouth open. Uh, do you think Ultimate Dragon will ever wrestle again? Uh, most likely no, unless it's like in a six-man tag where it's like for, where he's only in for like a minute or so. Yeah. Uh, whatever happened to Lex Luger? <laughs> whatever happened to his ability? Been asking uh, that for years. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. Uh, these are the first three tentative WCW taping dates. June 13th, Fairfax, Virginia. June 20th, Jacksonville. June 27th, Bethlehem, PA. I'll check on that. I'm sure you're right, though. Because um, I'd heard Fairfax as well. Um, I didn't hear the other dates. Uh, why? Okay. Da, 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 da. <laughs> if I met Hunter backstage, I would call him Tara. <laughs> oh, God. Um, in Wrestling with Shadows, you know this one, Bret Hart's wife is yelling at Hunter, calling him Hunter. I thought it was interesting because he was angry at a fictional character. <laughs> Everybody calls him Hunter, though. I know, I know. Question about a pay-per-view on free TV. Um, do you think a Royal Rumble or WrestleMania or SummerSlam on free TV? Like, for example, Big Show. I don't think people call him Big. They call him Big show? show. They probably call him they do Paul. Call him show. Yeah. Yeah. This is from someone who goes, does Terry Funk come into the Iron Man League? No, Terry Funk never wrestled consistently for 20 years, five nights a week. He had a few runs here and there. But Terry Funk's career as a full-time wrestler, except for, um, like, like the, he had that 1989 run in WCW. But for most of that, the last 20 years, um, he hasn't been doing, you know, you know, five, six night a week wrestling. You know, he, he would wrestle for like maybe a month two months, maybe three months, and then take, like, you know, just do weekends every now and then. I mean, he's never been, like, full-time for long periods of time, so he wouldn't be even close. Uh, someone's got Ricky Morton. The thing is, Ricky Morton's been working mainly weekends for so many years that I don't think he could come close to, like, the number of dates. It's like, like Satonico, who, like, really has wrestled full-time. Satonico might be the guy. And, you know, Perro, yeah. obviously, too. Um, as a person who's never seen mixed martial arts before, I'm wondering to watch a show at my local video store. They have a Pride DVD with Ken Shamrock on the cor on the cover. Would you recommend this one? Um, would you recommend Pride? Pride, I mean, Pride's a good show. You know, um, it's got the biggest name fighters. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's what we haven't talked about. Did you watch? Did you didn't watch the Pride, did you? Or did you? I'm supposed to have a tape here. Was, in fact, it was actually supposed to be here yesterday, but because it okay. is me, it was not here. Uh, we'll talk about that some other time, I guess. And not really much. Just when you see it, just let me know what you think. I mean, I. You know, this, the, 
you know, I, most of the people who I talked to liked the show more than I did. I liked it, but most people really liked it, and I, I don't know. You know, it's just short matches, and I don't like a, the brutality was a little too much in the Sakuraba Silva fight. I was just sad watching it, even though it was, for two minutes, it was a hell of a two minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, this is from Jay Thompson, who says, uh, do you think WWE -W can't succeed because it's women's wrestling or because it's Dave McClain? Um, I think it can't succeed because there's no way to make money. I mean, where does the money come in? It's not, it has nothing to do with Dave McClain. It? Yeah, but I mean, who's going to spend money on it? Even if, even if you watch it on TV, you know, it's like, where does the money come in? You can't tour with it and make any money because you can't sell tickets to it. And you can't put it on pay-per-view and make any money because they just tried that and did 6,000 buys for the whole country, which is unbelievably horrible. So, you know, there, that's, there it is. You know, it, it didn't work. I mean, yeah. and you're not going to build an audience because I heard that, you know, that show was the all-time worst. So what are these chances of these people getting into WCW? Don Marie, uh, I just don't know where their heads are at when it comes to Don Marie. I don't know. Francine, I know that Paul will push it, but I don't think, I don't think. Nova, maybe. Modest, probably not. Daniels, probably not. Lawler, no way. FBI. Let's see. Guido, Guido may have a shot. Tony Mamaluke, be tough. Prototype, uh, chance. Um, but if they, it's too soon. Chance they, in the they, future they, or chance right now? If they do it now, it'd be a huge mistake. Um, yeah. in six months to eight months, it might be, might be a pretty darn good idea. Super crazy. Um, I hope they do. I hope they bring in super crazy. He's good. Uh, was it just me or was Lee Spike Dudley real good last night? I don't know. Did you see that? Actually, it was it was a lot lot better than I expected. It was kind of like watching uh, I don't want to say Ric Flair and Vince Russo or something like that, but you could tell that uh, Spike was just doing his damnedest. Mm -hmm. Clean finish. Uh, though. That was disturbing. Let's see. What about airing the first WCW show from 11 p.m. to 1 a.m. on a Monday after Raw to get a good lead in and ensure a good rating for the first show and use it as proof for TNA and they deserve a better time slot? I don't think now, I mean, as far as like four hours of wrestling. Yeah, but I think that's the best idea to, to, to kick it off. I do think that's a good idea for the first week. Not every week, though. No, no. It's, it's not. It's, then they would, and WWE would want to do it anyway. Uh, but as far as, um, you know, just to say, okay, this is the first show and then start it the following Saturday, that's not the worst idea. Uh, let's go to Justin in Pennsylvania. Justin, what's going on? Hey, Dave. How's it going? It's going pretty good. Uh, I just have two quick questions. Um, about Foley's um, philosophical differences about the WrestleMania main event last year, mm -hmm. do you think he might have been upset about uh, having to play heel for part of the match, like after Big Show got eliminated and then he uh, he gave Rock the mandible claw? Uh, I doubt uh, it. I, I think, if, if anything, I think he was mad that he did it. In hindsight, because he wasn't in shape for it, and, you know, he, he had mentally retired. I mean, you could tell. I mean, he just, he was called back after he had figured he'd wrestled his last match, and it was, you know, he did it, you know, he got a big payday out of it, so I'm sure he's happy with that, but I think actually doing it, as far as the art part of it, I think that he felt that he shouldn't have been there. And then especially after... I think he's going to look back and regret doing it in the first place, and probably the only spot in the entire match he'll ever remember is when he tried to go off the post and came short. Yeah. Hit the edge of the table. All right, well, Other that, now, I don't think he's going to remember any That entire match was kind of a mess when you look back on it. But uh, the other question, uh, is Zach Arnold ever going to be back on the show? And uh, if so, can you get Trevor from Canada to call up again and talk to him? Um, I don't I don't know. I don't, I don't know of any dates that we have booked on him, and I don't know. Trevor from Canada. I, no, I don't know. Yeah, that was one for the book. Okay, yeah, thanks was, a lot, wasn't. guys. That was okay. a moment. Yes, it was. Sean, what's up, Sean? Hey, what's up, guys? Not too hey. much. Um, you know, I was thinking, um, I, you know, I can't believe Triple H. Like, you know, he, he was talking about putting people over and wanting to make money with some of the younger guys, but, you know, he put over uh, he put over the Undertaker at WrestleMania, and I'll tell you what, man, give that Undertaker a good gimmick, I th he's got a bright future. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, what, what the fuck is he thinking, you know? And... <laughs> He's swerving, just like everybody in wrestling. They he's they say smart, exactly what he's doing. He, they say exactly what you want to hear. I mean, everyone knows. Oh, I'll gladly put over anyone and shake their hand, and then you manipulate it so whenever you put people over, you're getting yourself over. No, I understand. Well, let me that. say right now, you can go. I put over the Undertaker clean in the middle of the ring on the biggest WrestleMania ever. But it's the fucking Undertaker, you know. It's not like putting over Benoit or Jericho or even Angle for that matter. Somebody, well, somebody who might need a big win on a big show. 
Yeah, well, you, you saw through it and I saw through it, but he's talking to people who didn't see through it. Which well, why, doesn't Mc, why doesn't McMahon see through it? Or does, does he not think, you know, Angle, the large Jericho can pull money working a program with Triple H? It's, I, I think or that... Or does he uh, even care? I mean, I think that it's one of those things. If, if they went to Triple H and go, this is the match, and, and, you know, you're supposed to put him over, he would do it gladly. I mean, or at least, I, mean, I wouldn't say gladly, but he would do it, no problem. He but would don't appear ask to be doing he, it gladly. Yeah, and he would appear to do it gladly. Yeah, but they don't, they don't ask because, you know, they have their, you know, I mean, I think that the whole thing was like, okay, we're going to set Undertaker up for, you know, Austin, so, you know, he saw that, you, you know, that's just kind of, just kind of like the storyline. They haven't, they haven't really asked him to put over Benoit clean yet. And so you know, it, it takes someone to, to uh, like, force the hand. Actually, they have. Remember that tag match where he fell off yeah, the ropes? Yeah, okay. Yeah, in the tag match where they did that was a good finish. One. Right, but yeah. if, they, if they want to do something with, even 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 just say, like, Benoit or Jericho, they need to do it. I, I can see them putting it off, like, so maybe, like, June or July, some, sometime, like, deep into the summer, where, you know, Triple H jobs during a Raw, you know, where, where everybody's watching. But they shouldn't put it off to a SmackDown where... You know, it, it, it. You know, yeah, he did a job, but it's not. It's not a high. It's not a high visibility job. Like he needs to do a clean in the middle of the ring where you know either like so one of the young guys sure. do it, but it's not going to happen. No, it will sooner or later. It has to. I just don't know when. <laughs> well, no, uh, I don't know. Ten years. And it might from not now. be for those guys. It might be for like the Big Show or something. Yeah. Yeah, it's been it's been wonders for Raven and Kane. So, all right, guys, <laughs> that's about it. Thanks a lot. Okay, is uh, is Alan next? Hello? Alan. Alan. Yeah, how you doing? Doing hey. pretty good. What's going on? Right, I had a quick question. I didn't want to, you know, not, I didn't want to, I don't know if I should ask on the radio or whatever, but a question. Um, I was wondering, like, everybody know, like, Goldberg and Raven, guys like that, Malenko, and I happen to be Jewish. They're Jewish, right? Goldberg, Raven, Malenko are all Jewish, yes. Yeah, I was curious. Are there any other wrestlers in the business? You know, I had a curiosity that are Jewish. There's probably tons of others. I just don't. You know, I don't know. Barry Horowitz comes to mind. That's the only one that comes to mind, but I'm sure there's many others. Oh, because I heard somebody, I read somewhere, I happened to go on uh, Missy Hyatt's website once, and she had, like, like you remember that Adam Sandler she, Hanukkah song? Oh, yeah, yeah. And yeah. she had, like, uh, some people listed on there. I don't know if she wrote it, and some of the names I didn't even know she had on there, like uh, Molly Holly and Kane and Albert, and I was, like, wondering if it was really? true. It might be. Uh, I, think I mean, I, I, much, she, um, I think all those names are accurate. I think, I think yeah, Matt Moon, yeah, he is. Ask Dave. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I think uh, I didn't know Molly Holly though. But then again, the name the name's Jew- it is a Jewish name. What Nor- Nora Green? Holly. Right? Oh. Yeah, Holly. <laughs> well, that's <not> right. <laughs> <laughs> Molly. It was funny. I was listening to Bite uh, Bite this once. I don't know if you ever listened to that before. No, because no. I think we're on the air around the same time they are. Oh, I see. I was listening to it once with Paul Heyman. He was like, "Funny, what, you know, about this." Some he's Jewish too. <laughs> yeah, some kid called up and he called him a dumb, you know. A Jewish kid. He asked him if he was Jewish, and he called him a dumb Jew or something. I don't know. Paul Heyman is just a funny character. Yeah, he is. He's very entertaining. Yeah. Very quick-witted. Yeah. But I didn't know if I should ask that on radio. I was just, you know, a curious question. It wasn't, you know. Yeah, yeah. And Missy Hyatt's Jewish too. Yeah, she is. Well, I don't know if she is this week. <laughs> she was. She was. She was. She. She. She married into the Jewish religion, but I don't know where it stands today. It's, it's been like a year or two. Hmm. Uh, I don't know when she's on the. She'll be. On, I, I know she'll be on the show again because she's got a book coming up, and when she is, we can ask her what her religion is. <laughs> <laughs> she's a character. Isn't she? <laughs> she's a character. Yeah, most people in wrestling are. Anyway, we are totally out of time right now. I want to thank everyone for joining in, and uh, we'll be on here tomorrow. We'll be talking about uh, Raw, and uh, we probably don't have Ken Shamrock on, but we may, and uh, we'll let you know tomorrow on the website <laughs> if we know any more, and. Uh, Anyway, I want to say goodbye, and we'll see everybody tomorrow at 5.